Hello, everyone. Welcome to the world's first conference about prompt engineering. We are super happy to have so many registrations for this conference and uh, so many people watch us online. And um, my name is Maxim Salnikov. I'm one of the organizers of um, this conference and I stream uh, from uh, Oslo, capital of Norway. So what's this conference ever about? And uh, does prompt engineering deserve a separate conference at all? We think yes, and we have very strong opinion on that. And we are here uh, all together with you to validate, to confirm, to approve that prompt engineering is an uh, emerging new discipline. It's a super important skill for building successful generative AI projects, products, applications, you name it. And uh, it can even be a separate profession for many of you. And uh, you give your answer after this conference. Uh, do you agree with us? We hope yes. We are here also to help you either to start your prompt engineering journey or to take it to the next level after watching sessions from um, experienced prompt engineers. We are also here to navigate into the future of prompt engineering, how the prompting will look like in one year, in two years, in 10 years. Um, yeah, let's see. And last but not least, we are here, and mainly you are here to, to gather as a prompt engineering community. That's super, super important. So I mentioned a few times, we, we, we. So who are we? As I mentioned, I'm just one of the conference organizers and uh, you see amazing people uh, together with me here. Eric, Dan, uh, do you want to introduce yourselves? Hey everybody, I'm Eric. I'm the founder of Prompt Perfect. Thanks everybody for coming. And I'm Dan, the co-founder of Prompt Hub. And yeah, thanks everyone for coming. It's gonna be a great day today. And we also have two amazing people who will help us, who will help you, who will support us uh, as track hosts and Q&A moderators. Goda, William, welcome, jump in. Hello, everybody. I'm Goda Go. I'm super excited for the session. Eric, Dan, uh, Maxim, kudos to you guys for pulling this off. Maybe some of you are watching this on my YouTube channel but I'm going to be leading the track one. So I'm very excited to see you there and share your questions with speakers. And thank you, G. Uh, I am Wes Shields, the founder of SynthMinds and the co-host of the How to Talk to AI podcast, along with the wonderful, the glorious go to go herself. I will be your guide, your steward, your shepherd, your moderator for track two. I hope to see you all there. Thanks. And conference is not possible without sponsors, right? And we have uh, amazing companies that uh, support us, but a bit later on that. Uh, to improve your participant experience, here are a few key resources, the important one, ones for the next five hours of the conference. And if I could share only one link that contains everything, that would be promptengineering.rocks. This is official site website of uh, our conference. It contains program, schedule, information about team. Uh, by the way, uh, there are also links to our social media profiles. Uh, my, Eric, uh, Dan, uh, Goda, Ves. Please stay connected with us. Send us LinkedIn connection requests. Uh, we'll be happy to approve this. Uh, and also, this is conference. This is not just a video on YouTube, right? Uh, and uh, we want to hear from you. We want to build proper interaction. And we have YouTube chat for that. If you watch this stream on YouTube, uh, you'll find this um, chat window. This is where we kindly ask you to send your questions to the speakers and we'll pick uh, relevant and the best ones for Q&A uh, sections. And by the way, folks, let's try this out, how that works. And uh, we are super geo-distributed team. We stream uh, from, from not only multiple countries, but multiple continents. And we want to hear from you. Where are are you watching us from which country which place which town which city which village tell us and uh, let's check that this interaction is working uh yeah i see that a few comments uh, started to arrive 
Cool. Thanks, folks. And please be social. We have Twitter account, or I don't know, we are old fashioned. We call still call this Twitter. We have X account. Uh, and uh, our today's hashtag is prompt and conf. Uh, please share your experience. Maybe you want to post a photo of you watching the conference. Maybe you have some, uh, some comments, maybe some invitations for your friends and colleagues for them to join us immediately. Yeah, post something on Twitter. We'll be super happy to see this. And uh, super briefly about conference structure. Again, in the name of the best participant experience. Uh, it's uh, super simple. We have uh, every of two tracks split into three sections. So we will do our best to start these sections in time. And basically, these are only hard uh, start times we have. Uh, what happens within section, uh, it's more flexible. I mean, there are uh, three technical sessions and Q&A following right after. Um, yeah, so folks, uh, if you want to join a particular session, just make sure that you follow all sections, just to make sure that you are in time. Sounds a bit more complex, but you will understand this, I'm pretty much sure. Um, yeah, more important information. Eric, do you want to say a few words about Code of Conduct? Yeah, so the Prompt Engineering Conference is an inclusive and welcoming conference for everybody. Uh, we require that everybody is respectful to each other. That includes those speaking and those attending and those that are in the chat. Uh, if you find somebody who is not, or if we find somebody who is not acting with that respect, uh, we will remove them from the conference. If you see any violations and you want to reach out to us, you can direct message us on X or Twitter at PromptEngConf or email us at hello at promptengineering.rocks. And finally, next finally, up, but, yeah, so we can do this without uh, yeah, so Prompt Perfect uh, optimizes your prompts directly in ChatGPT to ensure that you get high quality, relevant responses. If you want to learn more about us, you can go to promptperfect.xyz and find ways to reach out. And I'm also very proud to be one of the presenters and sponsors of this conference. Uh, my company, SynthMinds AI, is your full service AI agency. We offer consulting, we offer training courses and results driven solutions. Anything you're thinking about in the world of AI, please come and look us up on synthminds.ai um, in our Discord, which we'll share links to later, um, or on our LinkedIn page, which is also live streaming the first prompt engineering conference right now. Cool. Hey guys, when, when Maxim came to me and asked if I wanted to help co organize and sponsor this event, um, we knew Prompt Hub was a great fit because it's part of our goal to make this information accessible for everyone. And so if you're looking for a place to easily work with your team on prompts that you're deploying to production or working on in, uh, internal workflows, come check us out, sign, join the wait list. And if you email me, I'll get you set up uh, with access today. And I'll be on track too with Wes as well. And I'm very happy to share with you that we are also excited to sponsor. We have a podcast, How to Talk to AI, where we cover all the anything related to AI revolution and potential through prompt engineering and beyond. And by the way, don't worry that my face is being covered by comments. I'm perfectly fine. You can see me more on my YouTube channel. <laughs> oh. Sorry. So. Community partners, thank you so much. Uh, we have community partners from across the world. Uh, so thank you all guys for doing what you do with prompt engineering. And uh, as I mentioned, I'm going to be leading track one and we are going to kick off, uh, kick off with a really exciting talk from Ajit Jokar. And it's called Prompt Engineering, Democratizing Learning of AI Experiences from the University of Oxford. And over in, in track two, I will be uh, moderating and kicking off with a wonderful talk from Stefan Paran, uh, navigating the evolution of prompt engineering. Yes, folks, this is what's happening next. If you stay, if, if, if you wish to join the first session of uh, track one about uh, how Oxford is looking at prompt engineering, you stay here where you now. Uh, if you wish to uh, hear, hear more about evolution of prompt engineering, you just go to track two. Uh, you see a link on the screen. And uh, yeah, I'll also post this uh, to uh, YouTube, chat, YouTube chat in, uh, in a few seconds. And uh, yeah, then um, have a great conference experience. Let's start the show.
Okay, so I'm keeping this for a stage for a little moment. Anybody who wants to join Wes. And I'm excited to bring to you the first our speaker. Hi, Ajit. Excited to have you hello, here. Hello. Hi. Excited to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Yes. So I'm going to do try to do my best to make a good intro to you. I hope I don't disappoint. Um, but I'm super excited for your talk. So sure. I mean, just a brief intro is fine, and then then I'll I'll cover <laughs> it in my talk. Yeah. Perfect. So. As you can see, everyone, this is Ajit Jokar, is a London-based data scientist and academic. He serves as the course director of artificial intelligence at the University of Oxford, where he also conducts courses in fields like digital twins and cybersecurity. Through his company, Fine Labs, he focuses on building cutting-edge AI prototypes. Ajit has also lectured at esteemed institutions like LLC, and Harvard Kennedy School. Currently, he is working on a book aimed at teaching AI using mathematical foundations to high school students. Notably, his interdisciplinary research of Oxford explores AI in diverse applications such as quantum computing and effective computing. In addition to his professional roles, Ajit is an ad advocate for neurodiversity skill sets and mentors young people at Oxford and beyond. Thank you. This very is much. impressive, I did. Thank you. Thank you. So I am going to say good luck to you. I think everyone is super excited to hear from you. And I will catch you in QA session after our speakers. Excellent. So I uh, can I start presenting now? Yes. Yes, please do that. Thank you. Excellent. So I shall share my screen. And I shall share the entire screen. Very good. So, okay, do you see my presentation now? Yes, do you see my presentation? Sorry, do you see my presentation? Uh, sorry, uh, can I just check? Do you see my presentation or not? Yes, uh, I think you're muted. I think you're muted. You are muted, Goda. Oh, sorry. Uh, Ajit, yeah, we were seeing your yeah. presentation. Oh, you are sharing your full screen. Good. My apologies because I couldn't hear you. I was not, I did not <laughs> want to continue, uh, but I think it was you who, who was muted. Now I'm going to go back and share my presentation. So with this, because when I'm presenting in the full screen, I can't see the rest of the rest of it. Uh, so this is good. I present Understood. here, present here, slides. So I'm, I, uh, what is this now? Why is this not? When I'm presenting here, slides, one minute, present, stop screen. Okay, let me do this again, sorry. Uh, no screen. worries. We still, you Share know, screen. like we can be talking yeah. about no, AI, no, no, no. but that's still fine. struggling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fine. I think I think now I see this now. So this is good. And now I'm here now. So now now you should be able to see my screen. Yes. Good. Excellent. Yes. And I just added. So we are ready to go. Good. And I can hear you as well, which is great because that was my other, other thought of as well. Okay. So welcome everybody. Thank you for being here and thank you for the organizers for inviting us to the world's first prompt engineering conference. And uh, my subject is democratizing AI with prompt engineering and experiences from the University of Oxford. And why do I say democratizing? Because this is what we see as the value of prompt engineering. And we are unique to have actually conducted such a course over the last few weeks. And I'm going to share you my experiences and the experiences of our students into building such a course and the experiences of what they have gained from this course. And I hope you will find a lot of value in this discussion. First of all, a little bit about me. This is my LinkedIn profile. Feel free to connect to me. Uh, my main sort of characteristic is that I'm a, I'm a fellow at the University of Oxford. Uh, on AI with a focus on engineering sciences, uh, but also I have my own research company. So it's a kind of a hybrid of uh, both academia and research for that. Um, I also want to share my thank my colleagues, Anjali Jain, Chris Norik and Aisha Mutlu, 
for the help in preparing the course, uh, preparing this material and part of this course. Uh, and also, if you want to work with us and study with us, uh, feel free free to have a look at uh, our our course uh, links here, and and we are very happy to work with you on that. So, I want to start off with a quote from Pablo Picasso. And Pablo Picasso said that computers are useless; they only give you answers. Correct. And and and. That is relevant 50 years ago, as it, as it is relevant today, as it is relevant in the future. So prompt engineering is interesting because it then engages the human to ask the right questions. If we take the, the idea of, of Pablo Picasso in the future. And, and this is going to continue. And this is what excites us about prompt engineering because anybody can be uh, can actually engage with more sophisticated uh, AI work as I'm going to show you in our course. And this is one, one, of, one of our students. So this is a, a doctor, a medical doctor, and um, he shared this after the course. And um, what he said is that essentially is that he tried to learn Python many times and didn't quite get there. But now with prompt engineering, and with our course and with methodology, which I'm going to show you, he was able to skill himself to a data scientist level such that he was able to build applications on what was interesting for him. And this is what I mean by democratizing. This is the power of prompt engineering. It means that we can maybe inclusive. We can bring in people from all over the world into development, into data science. We can empower doctors. We can empower architects. We can empower uh, movie makers to, to actually create AI or, 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 or computing. So. That's what I mean by democratizing. And this is some of the experience that I'm going to share with you why we as Oxford are so excited about this idea and what is about rationale and the thought process for doing this. I'm very excited to share this with you with any, especially if there are any educators. Uh, we are very happy to share with you how we approach this subject because I think it's a great ecosystem for everybody to learn from each other. So uh, whoever is in the audience, feel free to connect to me uh, through the organizers or through, or through LinkedIn. So we believe in this thing. We believe that AI will not take your job, but people who know AI will. Uh, and this is important because let's not look at the doom and gloom. Let's look at what is really possible with AI. And, and, and prompt engineering brings that right down to very basic levels. And this is really what, what excites us about that. And for the first time in the world, this is a conference on prompt engineering, but I believe we at Oxford are the, for the first time in the world, a mainstream institution like Oxford has created an AI course for non-developers. And we couldn't be able to do this before uh, because historically you always needed to have a certain level of knowledge in Python before you attended an Oxford course. And this still continues. So we still have uh, traditional courses uh, which, which continue on very heavy Python work, which is a full stack AI course, and that's perfectly fine. But what is also interesting, what we thought about is to empower people who are at the periphery of development. That means business analysts, account managers, technical architects, data analysts, project managers, IT sales and pre-sales people, even HR people. So these people have always wanted to be in development, wanted to be in data science, but they could not have the skills. And we thought that this is this is perhaps an opportunity for the human and the AI to work together through the knowledge of prompt engineering and what can we do about it. So this is what really excited us and we decided to take this step. When we decided to make this jump, we looked at some of the ideas. And these are the seven reasons which we thought. Uh, that prompt engineering is not a fad and that we want to invest into it as a university as Oxford. And, and I, I, I'm very happy to share our insights and knowledge with other universities and other developers, if you so wish. The first one is what I've already mentioned so far is democratizing AI. That is a powerful idea for us. And we really believe in that. The second one is empowering developers. Now, developers all over the world are already um, empowered by all means, uh, but we just believe that it's a whole different level. Um, and, and you can see that uh, in, in various tools like GitHub Copilot and the productivity jump you get as a developer. The third one is we are seeing prompt engineering and MLP interfaces into most products. So if you look at traditional products like Splunk or database interfaces or everything like that, everything is getting a prompt 
interface. And when you have that, then you are thinking that prompt engineering is a skill in itself. It's a skill which is uh, which is sort of uh, w w which is abstracting from any particular platform or product, and that makes it extremely powerful. The fourth one is easier technologies are adopted and morphed. Uh, by morphed, I mean they, they change. And I give you an example of SQL. So SQL has been around for a very long time, but SQL is very easy. SQL is very easy to do, and it still is around today. In the world of AI, it isn't, it isn't going away. And I have seen it being adopted and used by different companies, different people, different platforms, uh, primarily because it is such a low common denominator. And we see the same thing with prompt engineering. It's well worth investing into this technology. And we call it a technology. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of share you why it's a bit of an art and a bit of technology, but still, uh, it, it still is a fundamental technology uh, into this, into this for the future. Then we thought about role of prompt engineering in the full stack. Uh, so this is a lot of work we are doing, especially at Oxford, working with companies like Microsoft and others. So we're looking at how we can take prompt engineering from everything across the agile, st agile stack, which means taking it from personas to test scripts, everything with that, and everything in the middle, correct? So what we are seeing today is development, prompt engineering for development and AI, but we see it extending in both directions, upstream to the upstream to the personas and downstream to the tests with that. And this is where we see prompts as the glue which unifies the full stack. Then we see autonomous AI agents are the future. If you're not following autonomous AI agents, feel free absolutely to do so. I think that is where the future of AI and future of prompt engineering is going to be. And then we think that there are many things in AI which are very interesting. So for example, what happens when AI can reason? Yes. And and we are we are we are getting into that discussion very slowly with some some sort of prompts and some sort of things going on. But I I I, I urge you to think as prompts not only as a as the chat GPT interface, but to think about it as as a, as dealing with an entity who is going to get more and more powerful, correct? I'm not talking about some esoteric consciousness type of thing, but I'm trying to say that that today you're dealing with something which is chat GPT predominantly, uh, and it has a certain level of competency. And what I'm trying to 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 sort of cast your mind in the future is to think about the idea that this entity you're going to deal with is going to be much more complex, much more richer, much more multilingual, um, and much more multimodal, um, and maybe capable of reason to a certain extent. And, and, and language to communicate with this entity is going to be prompt engineering. So this is how we see the world, and this is what, what, what made us commit to this course. And what we thought about was um, the philosophy is based on how to use generative AI, primarily for prompt engineering. And what we thought about was using low code and large language models. Now, we said that it assumes no, no, no knowledge of machine learning or coding, which means that it still means that upon completion of the course, you should be able to build machine learning and and uh, and generative using generative models. So that's a big ask, correct? So that's a big big ask for somebody who who may literally come from HR or maybe a doctor, like I shared with you, the example uh, has no knowledge of coding, and and you are going to tell him that after the completion of this course, you're going to tell him or her that after completion of this course, that they are able to be competent to a certain extent, build either a machine learning application or a, a, a computer science application using prompt engineering and coding. And this is a powerful idea. It's also a bit risky to understand, to make a commitment like this. So we were very confident, especially in our team uh, who, with whose help we managed to build this. Um, so we chose four platforms. We chose ChatGPT, GitHub Copilot, Power Platform, and OpenAI Code Interpreter. Uh, and the glue with this was prompt engineering. And we said that uh, we chose the platforms because we think low code is suitable for domain experts who do not code. It is suitable for developers who want to accelerate coding and it is suitable for automation of processes. So with that idea, we chose these four platforms and they, range in skill. Uh, 
So there is the GitHub Copilot, which is a strong developer focused platform. Uh, and then there is ChatGPT, which is the lowest common denominator across things um, and, and so on. So, so that's how we decided to choose four platforms with these three goals. Uh, and then of course you have the POP, uh, the POP platform. The POP platform is, is amazing because we, we then were able to build whole systems using, uh, using, uh, using AI with that. Uh, now, one important point I wanted to state with you is the word low code is different today than it was one year ago. If you looked at one year ago, which is effectively pre-generative AI, you are looking at low code, meaning effectively graphical user interfaces and configurations and so on and so forth. Um, but today, and, and of course you are doing a drag and drop. Today it is a little bit different. So it actually has that plus a few more things. The most two most important things are code generation ability, which means assisting, automating, the prompting, code snippets, structures that including the entire applications. And the second one is automation. This is extremely powerful areas of prompt engineering, which we thought were so exciting that that we 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 are committed to this concept. And I can tell you that this course was fully oversubscribed, and I still get people looking at it. And of course, we have other courses which we have launched now, and they are also going to include prompt engineering in quite a big way because we like the experience which we have gained by early adopters by adopting this strategy with that. So, and I already talked to you about the prompt um, in your. Uh, the prompt power platform, which I also, we also built it uh, with the end to end. So in the end, what was happening was people were able to look at multiple platforms, choose what they wanted with the glue of having prompt engineering across these platforms. Now, what is a practical way to apply prompt engineering for design patterns for data science? Now, I, I, I shared with you that this is an AI course, correct? So we are primarily an AI organization within Oxford. And I certainly, all my courses, including cybersecurity, digital twins, they all are basically AI courses. Now, we thought about what is a common paradigm which brings this together, and this was design patterns. So we thought that design pattern is a template or a description to solve a particular problem and used in different scenarios, it's a different situations. So we thought, how could we create design patterns using prompt engineering for the purpose of data science? Now, of course, there are many examples already of using prompt engineering with data science and prompt engineering with, with other things. And we, we, we use that, meaning that we picked up some of that and we adapted it to our application, which I'm going to share with you uh, with that. So we thought about three basic steps. And, and, and what, what was underlying was a problem that applying prompt engineering patterns in isolation is hard. Rather, we thought about prompt engineering as a solution to problems in steps where the smallest building block is a, block is a prompt. So we decided that look at the problem types. In our case, in data science, there are typically four problem types, which are the, which are the simplest levels. Uh, they are the regression, classification, clustering, and MLP. Now, these are not simple. What I mean, uh, these are most common. Correct. Then the second one was we thought about creating patterns for each stage of the flow. So look at data cleaning, look at each of the stages. We thought about creating patterns. And third, and the most important, we thought about designing mitigation patterns for by problem statement. Now I'll explain to you what mitigation patterns is. So this is how it looks like. So if you have some familiarity with data science, then this is the overall flow of data science. You generate data set, you suggest data set, you do data exploration, you build a model, you train a model, and so on. And we broke that down into a series of sub steps with that. And for each of those sub steps, we have one or more prompts, which is what I'm going to share with you more or less. Uh, and then there are other steps, of course. So there's hyperparameter tuning, addressing imbalance of data, then there is clustering, dimensionality reduction, and then there are some more things, explainable AI, and so on. And then we thought about also using conceptual knowledge based things so data exploration data visualization and data machine and machine learning so we 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 realize that there are people who are who are working with us who actually do not know some of the terms used in machine learning so our idea was why don't we just teach them using prompt engineering correct rather than us having create one more lecture one more thing one more session 
why don't they just teach them how to how to fish so to speak so that was our our philosophy in which we brought this thing together and this is how we did it and how we did do it so this is examples of this and this goes on for a bit of time but what we thought about this is how you generate data so these are the prompts and typically we ask you to act ask the gpt to act as something and then we give it lot of detail now the important thing is actually the details so for example these were all created by my colleague Aisha and Anjali and what we try to do here is that we uh, we say that I want to act I want you to act as a data simulation expert and generate a data set that simulates a certain process with certain parameters and we keep on throwing this at the prompt engineering idea where we build certain things now everybody knows that obviously everything you build from prompt engineering you can't actually use it as it is and this is perfectly fine so we are using it as a tool to generate something and this is where the mitigation patterns come into play then suggesting data set the same idea we we, we think about you as a data science career coach and we want a productive model for something so this is always a strategy we always ask it to act as something and then uh, then we ask it to give something and then we put as much detail as possible into our prompts and the prompts are detailed with that and and this goes on and on so even when we talk about data merging data reshaping summary statistics uh, so it's not like we just don't say that okay give me a summary statistics or something we are always building some level of detail with that and including data pre-processing this is a classic sort of finding missing values finding duplicate records um, and so on so we keep on providing all this sort of a context and, and knowledge partly which we have built up from searching on on other prompts in the web and also partly we have built up based on our own knowledge so but the significant thing is we put all that in a workflow because what happens with the student then is the student is given a problem i'll explain this to you further and then they are given all this uh, effectively these patterns and then the student works with the problem with the pattern with the data set and then off they go trying to build something and in this case they they, they are achieving a lot just by doing prompting because then that gets us maybe about 60 70 percent of the of the way and then they have to work further from there but this is the beauty of what we are trying to do uh, then this goes on to data wrangling data visualization feature engineering uh, this is obviously for data scientists you know that these sort of things take a lot of time to do and then we of course build the model so we talk about how to build the model using uh, using the core obviously to run the core you need an ide correct so it depends on which platform you are working with uh, for example if you're working with a copilot then you have to set up your ide using anaconda or something like this if you're working with uh, just straightforward chat gpt then you have to generate the code and copy the code into something else like a collab notebook um, or, 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 or or anything else and or any other ID visual studio code and then run it like that so this is still a little bit of a step from just running some prompting and running an output but what we believe is that it takes people a hell of a lot forward what they would do uh, if they didn't have these tools um, and the significant thing is is it's is across all the steps you can see this correct including things like hyperparameter tuning data imbalance clustering dimensionality reduction and so on and so forth so this is basically where it it goes on and on with that so um then assuming you have generated the code what is the next important step the next important step and the very important step is mitigation strategies now mitigation strategies uh, is we we actually encourage students to spend a lot of time in mitigation strategies and why did we do that think of what pablo picasso said correct so don't trust what is out there what it has been produced uh, but rather trust yourself so we teach students to understand what is wrong so understand what is erroneous coding, how to improve your code, how to make, how to write maintainable code, how to write security, how to write functional code, how to prevent hallucinations. And then we also look at a whole bunch of traditional uh, sort of design patterns, and that includes chain of thought, least to most, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. So given a problem, given a problem, this is a this is a regression prompt from Anjali Jain, uh, who is my colleague at Oxford. And what we did, this is the sort of prompt we start with the regression, correct? And this goes on to three pages here. This is our prompt um, and it goes on here. So it ends here, yeah. Um, but the 
significant thing about it is that it is very detailed. It's not just your usual sort of give me something on regression, uh, but it also ends very, very cleverly. It ends in a way which says that after each step, give me the code, explain the concepts using the code, make compatible with Jupyter Notebook code, uh, and, and, and make sure that it should work with the previous step. So this is very interesting. It's amazing what prompt engineering gives you if you are if you ask the right questions and if you are detailed with your questions and and that's the level of detail we go to and and again i i appreciate that not everybody is a data scientist here on this course but i guess most people would be able to understand what i'm trying to say here is the idea that 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 it is about the level of knowledge you have about a subject. So, for example, if I were to try this for the legal profession, I would fail hopelessly. I have no clue about legal things, correct? But this stuff we know. We know how it works. So we know how to design the prompt so that it, it makes it useful. Um, and then we thought about there's a whole large number of prompt engineering techniques. And 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 to be honest, it does sort of overwhelm you. Uh, I, 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 we follow research papers and every two days something so spectacular happens, yes? Everybody says that this is the new way to go and this is the new technique. And, and if you look at a particular paper, it's essentially a prompting technique um, and it's chain of thought prompting, uh, leads to more self-consistency decoding and there's a whole list of them. Uh, and we thought, okay, this is great. We will include them will show how they work, but our goal is to solve our problem. Our problem as a data scientist is very specific. We then look at the data science workflow and break that into prompts, into design patterns. And then we see how that fits in and how we see how mitigation patterns are on top of that. And then we provide these wider set of prompts as a series of cross references. So this is then creates a repository or a knowledge base for our students to take them, accelerate them to a very significant level, even if they are not developers. And this is what I see as the power of prompt engineering. And this just goes on, correct? So there's all these other things which go along as well. Just to recap, this is the set of sequences for this. Uh, for uh, These are the same steps which are in machine learning, and these are some of these ideas uh, from, uh, these are some of the references I took on the web. Uh, but I come back to our student, correct? I come back to the to the power of prompt engineering, which was shared by a comment from our student. Uh, and, and what he said essentially is the same. This is a medical doctor from Cambridge. And he, he basically said that I couldn't have done this without uh, without without this sort of uh, ability. Uh, and it is it is truly empowering as educators it's, it's amazing to see this as to what is education correct in the end of the day education is that I, I, I you start at a particular point and you end at a particular point after the course and you should be empowered to do something you should be able, able to take that knowledge and apply it into your knowledge your domain and and we see this today and I have got other examples I am happy to share with you I mean I mean this one was just because it was on, on, on LinkedIn and it was so so appropriate at that time Time. Um, again, come back also with Pablo Picasso. So, so think about yourself. Think about your own abilities. Think about the the potential of what you could do by engaging with uh, with. AI through prompt engineering. And, and as usual, feel free to stay in touch with us. Thank you also for my colleagues. Thank you for the organizers, Maxime and, and, and all the team for inviting me. Um, and and yes, very happy to, to, to stay for questions here as well. Um, so is that good? Do you see me back now? This was amazing, Ajit. Thank you so much. Uh, we have so many questions for you. So I will just encourage everyone to stay for two more sessions. And then we will be joining Ajit and two other speakers for Q&A. So Ajit, we will pass on to you the questions, read them through, and then let's try to answer as much as possible. This was incredibly impressive. Thank, thank, you. thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for the questions. For some reason, I cannot uh, join the chat. I don't know why, but uh, but uh, if you share with me the question, how are you going to share the questions with me? By uh, the team will pass them to you yeah. directly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, Do that. But I'll be online here, and and I'll be back for the Q and A. Correct. So I'll I, I'm here, and then we have a face to face Q and A. Correct. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Very good. Thank you Excellent. so much. Thank you again for inviting me. Talk to you in a second. Everybody else. Thank you. Okay, everybody, I hope that you are 
pumped for the next sessions because we are, this is going to be just getting more interesting. So the next speaker that we have is Rohan Singh Rajub. And I'm so sorry if I'm butchering names as someone with the impossible to pronounce surname. My apologies. But a little bit about uh, Rohan Singh Rajib is a senior data scientist at Headspace. So if you ever got overwhelmed about craziness in AI, I definitely recommend Headspace. He specialized in uh, personalization. With over eight years of experience, he has led multiple successful machine learning projects and has been recognized with a patent. Rohan has an influential presence on LinkedIn with over 11 thousand followers and is a frequent speaker at data science events. He has also contributed to Fortune 500 companies like Disney and Ticketmaster. So everybody, please welcome uh, Rahut's presentation, which is going to be about prompt-based recommendation systems, a new era of personalized experiences. And we will be kicking off just in a moment. Here you go, everybody. Please enjoy. Hello, everyone. My name is Rohan Rajput. I'm a senior data scientist at Headspace. Today, we will be talking about prompt-based recommendation system, a new era of personalized experience. So. In today's agenda, we'll first talk about like what is LLM-based recommendation system. We'll go over some basic foundation where we'll discuss about what are what is recommendation system and uh, how we can use like prompt engineering to upgrade our next generation of recommendation system. These recommendation systems comes up with their own shortcoming so we'll be discussing about importance of fairness and bias in recommendation system especially llm based recommendation system and uh, we'll try to uh, address some of this shortcoming with some of the proposed solutions and uh, we'll conclude this presentation with ongoing effort and future direction so let's start so what is LLM-based recommendation system. So before talking about LLM-based recommendation system, first, as you all are in prompt engineering uh, conference, you all know that what is LLM system. The LLM systems are machines that are trained on vast amount of text data, and, and they are pretty good at predicting next words in a sequence. These are the common examples of LLM systems, Chat GPT, Google Bard, and recently Facebook Llama. Now let's dwell into what is recommendation system. A recommendation system is a subclass of information filtering system. That means they help us to process information using historical user and item data. And it helps in user decision-making. So for example, whenever you open Amazon website, you see recommended product for you. These recommended product comes from various uh, uh, analysis of historical data done by machine learning systems that actually gives you a recommended products. Similarly, we see Netflix, which is an online streaming service, produces these uh, various, uh, what we call uh, horizontal shelves that actually help us to recommend various content on the screen. Same goes for the news article. Uh, it's a personalized curated news for us provided by Google using lots of uh, user item interaction data. Now, what is prompt-based recommendation system? So, so as we have already know that what is a like LLM system and what is a recommendation system? So there is a new field emerging today. It's called LLM-based recommendation system. And uh, because a uh, vast amount of recommendation systems work on some sort of sequential data, 
So for example, there is whenever you watch a movie on Netflix, there is some kind of uh, temporal order you you follow when you watch a movie, right? You, you you on Monday you watch something, on Tuesday you watch something, and similarly for the week you create like an uh, you know uh, your own uh, personalized timeline, right? It if when we use collaborative filtering, we can utilize other users' data to curate a personalized timeline for you. Now, when we deal with this kind of sequential data, we can actually use the sequential data to generate next, similarly like a LLM model, model where we uh, predict the next uh, word in the sequence. Similarly here, using your historical uh, item interaction, we can actually predict what you will be watching next. So uh, we can divide these uh, LLM-based recommendation system into two tasks. Like first is the prediction task, and another one is the generation task. Then the prediction task, right? So we can see here that we can train a model, which can be like a, one of uh, these like model that can help us to predict no, ne next top K predictions for you. So if you see this, uh, top left corner, like this example, based on the movie history, please recommend five candidates of the movie that user might be interested, right? So our system can actually generate like five candidates for us. Similarly, we can do a rating prediction, means that this is the historical rating given by this user to these movies. Can you suggest me for this new particular movie, what could be a, like, you know, rating from one to 10 points? And it can like, you know, suggest a rating for us. Now these are like prediction tasks. Similarly, we can also do generation tasks. Generation tasks are useful where we want to like, you know, interact user or uh, for example, in a conversational recommendation system where a user is asking to a system that because I recently watched this movie Intercellar, please recommend something to me. And based on like user data, uh, this conversational system actually generate like some recommendation for this particular user or can ask like more clarifying questions to this user to, to recommend some movie to them. Similarly, we can also incorporate explanation to recommendation system that, uh, uh, so this new, new we got father two is recommended for a user who has recently watched this thinking. So we can actually ask that why this new movie was recommended to this particular user and the LLM system can provide us, you know, the explanation of why this, what type of data has been used and why this movie was recommended to user. So there is a, some kind of explainability we can incorporate in our recommendations. And all of these things, if you see like they are using like some kind of prompt to generate recommendations. Now, there is a uh, one research done by University of Rotters where uh, they propose this P5 uh, model. This P5 model is very similar to the T5 model in transformers. Uh, the the difference is that here we are talking about prompt based recommendation system so here this is like an example of multi task recommendation system where it can use like this sequential to se sequence to sequence framework to generate multiple types of recommendation so let's let's see here on the top you see that if you want to do like a sequential recommendation like we can actually give like a sequence of user id uh, or item ID to recommendation system and ask it like, what is the next uh, ID predict for the user? Like similarly, we can do rating prediction, explanation generation, review summarization, direct recommendation, right? Or zero sort generalization. Here, what we want to do that, like we have uh, some information metadata available for this particular user and using this metadata and this prompt, can we inject this prompt to, uh, uh, generate some recommendation. So this is like one of the framework is proposed by uh, University of Rotters. Uh, 
similarly there are like some problems uh, we found in like this kind of prompting so so no system is uh, you know perfect solution there no solution is a perfect solution and there are like some some problems we have to solve before these uh, systems can become reality right uh, one of the thing we have seen that uh, there are two types of uh, prompting we can do right so there is a so there is a one method is is called like a point wise uh, prompting and another is like a list like so there is a point wise approach and list wise approach and what do you mean by point wise and list wise approach in the point wise approach right you can actually pass a passage you can give a query and ask like a binary solution from 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 the LLN system so you want like a single definite answer that in the form of let, let's say boolean yes and no from this LLN system so another one we can do is uh, the list wise approach right in the list wise approach we actually uh, give like a, a certain uh, options to you to llm system and ask it to rank so let's say in the first example we we give like you know uh, entire user history or like some sort of user history generated by some kind of prompt system and we ask a query that using this particular metadata will you recommend this movie to this user or not and the system will say yes or no but the next one you can give like okay i have like this five option for this user and out of these five option what particular movie like uh, give me the ranking on which like uh, you would you would want to recommend this user this particular movie right and the llm system can generate this uh this twice uh, you know the ranking for us that help us to uh, recommend to our user right uh, there are some problems in this approach obviously uh, in the in the point wise uh, in the point wise approach like uh, we have like the calibration problem and in the second in the second like this is like the experimentation output right so uh, what is the output generated like uh, what is the output uh, observed by uh, these researchers in this particular paper that there are like uh, in the list wise approach there are like lots of uh, inconsistency or like a, uh, there are other uh, phenomena observed in this uh, list wise approach so one of them like uh, sometime the llm only output the partial list that means like uh, it sometime omits uh, uh, certain elements from the list when it was uh, generating the output uh, it refused to perform like uh, it's refused to give like any kind of ranking in some cases there is like lots of repetition like and also inconsistency sometimes like the same prompt they were giving uh, some ranking but if you change a little bit of information it completely changed the uh, ranking of the list even though there was not substantial changes in the metadata right so there are still like lots of uh, uh, uh hurdles we have to solve before like uh, uh using the system in the real world solution so these are like all the research problems open research problems we have and these are like i would fairly say like these are like technical problems for now right to build this system there are some more uh important problems that we will be seeing that can happen like in this llm based system so one of the important aspects in LLM based system is uh, fairness and bias. So when uh, when we incorporate these systems, like uh, LLM system itself, uh, like because they are trained on like vast amount of uh, text data, and historically there were like some some of the bias and bias and fairness problem was. Uh, available in those data set that actually sometimes reflects in the output of this LLM system. And these LLM, if, if the output of this LLM system contains these kind of biases that can amplify it in a recommendation system also, because this is another like black box machine learning system we are adding to it. So some of the important domains where we should address these problems are like education, criminology, finance, and healthcare. So, Take example of finance, right? 
uh, there is a like a there is a some kind of bias can uh, in cop can be incorporated like uh, in LLM based uh, recommendation system in finance that projects someone's like you know mortgage application and if someone asks for explanation it gives like you know a biased like view of uh, uh, someone's like race or someone's like you know uh, ethnicity or some kind of like a uh, social factors so we have to be very careful when using this system in this crucial application so we uh, we make sure that we are not uh, unfairly treated some segment of the group right there are like several dimension has been studied in this fairness of chat gpt paper where statistical parity equal opportunity equal odds overall accuracy quality and counterfactual fairness these are the several dimension of fairness uh, uh, were studied in this particular paper i think the overall conclusion of the paper was uh, the chat gpt has comparatively better score than like you know traditional models like a, a regression model or a natural like a multi layer perceptron model but is still having some of the issues that should be solved before we use it uh, these systems on a very large scale now uh, continuing co continuing this 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 problem uh, there is another important uh, the, the big problem uh, is is is, a, is right now persists in LLM system is called hallucination. So in the hallucination, it actually sometimes, you know, uh, provide us like, you know, false or misleading uh, information. So one of the example we can take that, like uh, when uh, uh, you actually recommend some kind of product uh, to a user and you want your like LLM system to automatically write a product description, right? And it can sometimes like, you know, write a, like a false description uh, that is misleading to user. It's it, it, so suppose like it's some, somehow figure out that like, you know, if uh, certain uh, phones that are like pretty high selling right now, and they contain a certain type of text description that makes its sales more likely to sell that actually copy that it can copy those like, you know, uh, description attributes and try to change like, you know, existing uh, description and try to market some of the feature which is not available in the in the in the product itself, right? Or like overselling um, some kind of like, you know, false marketing in, 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 in the description of the product. So we have to be make sure that like uh, these type of a problem should be you know properly addressed another thing we see in the conversational like ai is that like it sometimes uh, it can sometimes like solution uh, suggest like unrealistic solution so for example uh, if someone is like you know on a like weight loss journey and uh, 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 the person is using our like uh, llm based recommendation system and the LLM based recommendation system starts suggesting some kind of unrealistic diet plan, like, you know, stay hungry for like next 12 hours and, you know, uh, cut down your, like, you know, most of the meals for the day. And like that can lead to like certain kind of nutrition deficiency or like uh, uh, it can also uh, cause several other medical problems. So we should be, uh, we should be vetting those uh, outputs properly. Uh, we should make sure that our models are not like, you know, fabricating information or forging some kind of ideas, right, that are not realistic or sometimes not like, you know, appropriate for users. Okay, so what can we do, right? What can we do? These are the all the problems we have discussed and what can we do about these problems, right? So few of the things we can do. Uh, one of the thing uh, we can do is like, uh, incorporate some some kind of like data and algorithmic solution then the data pre-processing we can do like some kind of bias identification or like a, some kind of augmentation to remove like some of the biases uh, we can also make sure that if there is some kind of uh, sensitive attribute present in our data set we make sure that we we properly either remove it or handle it like you know carefully so one of the example we see that in recommendation system when we use data of like you know movie length data or insurance data we see that, that these are like very sensitive attributes and the distribution of the sensitive attributes in those uh, data set 
uh, one we can see that like in the movie lens data set we have like gender age and occupational data set available and obviously like uh, we have uh, another set of data here uh, in the insurance uh, data set where the the marital status occupation gender all these things are available and sometimes these actually attributes make more impact than decision making of the system so we have to make sure that we uh, are uh, properly uh, analyzing those impact of those attributes uh, one of the solution we can do is like uh, just use like tree based model to understand that how much like impact this particular attribute is making but again like this problem is getting very challenging when we use like these complex llm based system where we don't have access to this information uh, that uh, clearly uh, there's a very lots of abstract layer that actually goes into decision making and sometimes it's very difficult to understand why system uh, suggested this particular solution and what are the factors are impacting it uh, second is algorithmic fairness so we can put like some kind of fairness constraint and multi-objective optimization so for example like you know you uh, when you have a recommendation system you don't just like uh, uh, try to increase like uh, engagement or click through rate from that recommendation system try to have like more multi multi objective here so in the multi objective optimization you put like some more objective to optimize for example having like low or better long term value or like increase like serendipity of user and all those things uh, we should have like some kind of fairness audits and feedback loops to make sure these are like very um, prominent in recommendation system, especially the feedback loop, because you are influencing your user with some kind of decision making and that decision making is actually uh, uh, changing the behavior of user right and start like you know putting user in some kind of filter bubbles where user is like you know a fee, uh, you know uh, getting feedback of on of this of their own action right um obviously like explainability and uh, transparent algorithm and user control is very important that we should have like some kind of control to like you know mitigate those biases in the database uh, uh, diversity and compliance are very important here uh, diversity means like uh, sometime we we want to make sure that like uh, sometime it, ha it it might happen that uh, our user satisfaction sometimes get impacted if we increase diversity of the content but we me we make sure that we provide equal chances to all the segment of user so in the music music app right so if we have like so certain you know new artists those are not very famous but we want to give them more chances like you know to uh, get uh, not uh, uh, getting stuck by our recommendation system by popularity bias like just showing popular recommendation to everyone won't work we have to sometime like you know increase the diversity of the content and it could be like very societal diversity or like a within the content diversity should follow all the regulatory compliance especially if we are healthcare solution like obviously we should follow like all the HIPAA compliance and different type of reg regulations uh, regulations around it so what are the ongoing efforts uh, uh, are in the field of llm based recommendations and what are some of the future direction uh, obviously one one important thing we can do is like uh, do like user education and monitoring so uh, sometime it cannot be like you know uh, well received by our user that like if we try to increase diversity our user might complain that why i'm getting this kind of content because i don't follow this kind of or i don't align with this content we can educate users on like our fairness metrics so uh, we can make sure that like you know all 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 segment of population whether it's a gender wise or age wise they, they, they treat it fairly right we can implement some kind of real-time fairness monitoring solution there are various matrices like a, 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 let's say a entropy or coverage or diversity right uh, uh, there are lots uh, there are lots of metrics available that can be monitored real time to understand that how system is behaving for all set of users we can do like third party audits and community involvement so basically it can be like you know uh, sometime it's uh, very difficult for to 
to us to understand that if we are like making a fair system or not. So having like an external audit can get us like some kind of unbiased evaluation and also uh, opening up with a, like a public feedback, like collecting like feedback from user or do like user study or user survey to understand that uh, are we, you know, uh, making, uh, are, we, are we correctly measuring our fairness or not? So, uh, in conclusion, the fairness-based LLMs are not just technical issue, but it's like a very societal issue. It's, it's uh, it needs like a, a continuous effort from all the set of users and all the set set of like different other segments to make sure, uh, right from like you know from engineers to like you know stakeholders to uh, senior leaders, we have to make sure that everyone is contribute to make this system fair and responsible. With that, I would like to conclude my presentation. Uh, thank you so much for attending this. If you have any questions, please reach out to me on LinkedIn. And this is my LinkedIn profile. And uh, thank you so much. Uh, hope you have a good rest of your day. Thank you, Rahul. This was amazing. And we will make sure, again, to answer your questions, especially about privacy as well. Um, moving on, this session I am personally really excited about because we are going to hear from an architect. And it may be like very few of you know that my background goes all the way back in the days to architecture. So we are going to talk about generated cities and architecture. F and we will listen to Dr. Isaac Glass. So a little bit of an intro. Um, uh, Dr. Isaac Glass is an acclaimed architect with a specialization in acoustics and algorithmic design. She holds a doctorate in construction technology and has developed cutting edge design methods and simulation programs. Dr. Glass has an impressive portfolio of international projects ranging from Istanbul to Libya. Currently, she is engaged in research on synthetic data generation and smart city applications through the Daphne project. She is also a musician having performed at the Tyler Theater. So I hope everybody is excited about this session and welcome Dr. Hi everyone, my name is Aisha and I'm a postdoctoral researcher in digital city science at Harvard City University Hamburg. I am involved in the Daphne project which is funded by BMBF and encompasses collaboration with educational and commercial partners. Additionally, I teach courses on architectural acoustics, simulations, synthetic data generation and artificial intelligence for urban design. Furthermore, I am responsible for leading the smart city use cases. Artificial intelligence represents a novel tool within the field of architecture and urban design. In addressing complex problems, computational design often encounters limitations. Digital city science, led by Professor Dr. Jörg Nönig, comprises a team engaged in various projects, models, applications and city tools. Our focus lies in exploring how new digital technologies can integrate within existing urban systems and facilitate user-oriented participatory planning, cooperation and co-design. We are developing new tools that enable comprehensive scientific investigations, identify trends, generate theoretical findings and inform policymakers and decision makers. Our aim is to establish systematic knowledge concerning the conception, design and implementation of digital tools and processing technologies. By leveraging digital data generated within urban systems, we strive to make our cities healthier, more livable, sustainable and comfortable for citizens. In projects like Daphne, which involve big data sets and diverse smart city algorithms and AI methods, the incorporation of AI can take the form of visualization, optimization, analysis or planning. Within our project, we have defined 10 use cases, including movement in urban districts, which is about mobility, tourist transfer to mobility centers, urban civil protection, hazard prediction at major events, bridge maintenance, preventive management of air pollution, social dynamics at places of knowledge and innovation, light and mobility, watering for climate green space irrigation, city signal statistical methods, and semantic CMS. Our primary focus is on two approaches, mobility and the maintenance. We have developed a tool called Motivity, which generates paths for citizens 
that are either happier or, or unhappier. To achieve this, we have implemented a scoring system with an agent-based simulation using deep reinforcement learning, which is connected to a survey. The AI plays the game according to the rules set given by the scientists and learns through explorations on real maps. The output of these algorithms provides valuable insights. Creating use cases in urban design involves six case steps, from identifying challenges to validating synthetic data. These steps ensure that AI contributes to creating smarter, more efficient and sustainable urban environments. Within the context of architecture and smart cities, we identify challenges and problems. To address these, we seek intelligent algorithms and models for analysis, synthesis and prediction. To ensure accurate results, we train the models. In certain cases, extended data might be unavailable due to reasons such as data protection and or resource constraints. We generate synthetic data and validate the methods for use in city design. In the field of urban data analytics, the data can often speak for themselves. Unlike traditional approaches with theory, human bias and framing, urban big data analytics strives for a new perspective. It seeks to generate hypotheses and insights directly born from the data rather than being shaped born from the theory. Large language models play a crucial role in processing vast urban datasets, aiding in hypothesis generation and insights extraction. Also itself is a synthetic data generation. Real-world impact insights from, born from data analytics can drive informed urban planning, enhancing the quality of life for the citizens. In the era of urban big data and LLMs, a data-centric approach allows urban insights to flourish organically, shaping smarter, more adaptable cities. Prompt engineering contributes to architectural design, design in numerous ways and opens up new possibilities. Creating architectural concepts, for example, prompt engineering creates innovative architectural ideas, providing inspiration and direction to designers. It can generate multiple design alternatives, which is enabling exploration and creativity for the designer. Prompt engineering helps bridge the gap between technical jargon and the non-scientific language, enhancing the client-architect communication. By harnessing prompt engineering, architects can seamlessly integrate the other cutting-edge technologies like VR, AR or other engineering fields like acoustics, energy efficiency, sustainability into their designs. Architects can use prompts to explore and optimize spatial layouts, ensuring efficient design concepts. Prompt-driven AI can assist in complex computation streamlining design process. Designers can leverage prompts to experiment with architectural patterns, fostering uniqueness and style. Incorporating prompt engineering in architectural design opens up innovative possibilities and shapes more dynamic, efficient and imaginative urban spaces. Here you can see inspiration, generation of ideas, concept assessment, concept integration and synthesis processes for AI and human. In the design process, the synergy between human and AI interaction facilitated by prompt engineering is the key to unlocking innovative solutions for urban design and architecture. Working in tandem, AI and human designers integrate diverse concepts. This dynamic partnership between humans and AI is instrumental in unlocking innovative solutions for urban design and architecture. It combines the creative potential of AI with human expertise, resulting in designers that are not only visionary, but also programmatic and sustainable. Here you can see this concept of the design through prompt engineering for architecture. There are also challenges in AI-assisted design. For example, sourcing and data quality, ethical considerations, AI as a tool, not, a not as a replacement. For example, architects must view AI as a valuable tool, not a replacement for human expertise. Limitations of AI should be always keep in the mind. Precise prompt interpretation is very important to maintain the design process through the AI and human interaction. Crafting accurate and unambiguous prompts is a skill that architects must develop. Here you can see examples of different prompts and their outcomes. If we want to design a future city focused on energy efficiency, AI generates futuristic designs within the elements of green energy efficient technologies. 
architects refine and adapt AI-generated concepts. This can be also an experimental with the historical, non-historical concepts, uh, mixing up the non-existent materials such water, wood, or metallic wood, or fusioning in between the cities. For example, Hamburg with Berlin. Benefits of prompt engineering, architects can explore unique and innovative design concepts inspired by AI-generated prompts. We can have enhanced communication between technical and non-technical languages, which leads to better understanding. Designers can explore a wide spectrum of creative possibilities. AI-powered prompt engineering speeds up the design process. Text and visual prompts enable swift and efficient iterations. Also, architects can integrate other engineering disciplines seamlessly. Those benefits make prompt engineering a valuable tool in architectural design, fostering innovation, improving communication, enhancing exploration, streamlining efficiency, and prompting multidisciplinary collaboration. As we look ahead to the future of architectural design, several factors can be seen. We need to improve AI models, we need to develop advanced visualization tools, working in integrated prompts, ethical guidelines for AI-driven design and expanding use cases in planning and design. In conclusion, generated cities, architectural design and prompt engineering are important elements of the future of urban planning. While challenges face, the collaborative synergy between human creativity and AI-driven efficiency through large language models is set to redefine how we design and build cities for a better and more sustainable future. Thank you so much. Everybody, I want to introduce you to the lady you were just listening. Hi, Ais, how are you? Hi, thank you so much. I'm good. How are you? I'm fantastic. So I just wanted to say this is as an architect, I was just like excited over the moon I'm going to be sharing with every <laughs> architect in my yes. network. So while we're waiting for um, our Ajit and Rahu to join, I will take the opportunity and, you know, ask you first. So the, the question I have, like, so back, back in the days, which was like more than a year ago, which is crazy, I made a video on YouTube um, and it was, who is going to build in the metaverse, architects or AI? And that, you know, at that time, metaverse was like such exciting topic, but now, you know, hearing that there is so much resource, so much guidance that you are giving to actual architects build in the real world. Um, this is fascinating. Thank you so much. I just had to fangirl a little bit here. <laughs> Thank you. It's so nice to hear. Thank you so much. <laughs> That's so kind. <laughs> and regarding questions, so I'm going to just pop one. So you, you got a lot of questions. So let's see if we will be able mm -hmm. to cover. Uh, yeah. I will invite Ajit to the stage. Hi, Ajit. Welcome Hello. back. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hi, everybody. Okay, so as I said, ladies first. So um, one of the questions <laughs> from Darth Looper was, how can these six steps that you just showed be broken down into more concise and precise requests to ensure results accuracy? Yeah, it's a very, very big question, I think. It's a very open question because, like, I... I in my imagination, it could be a lot of questions. For example, the first step is anyway asking the challenges and the questions about the city problems or the architectural problems, challenges. So it can be a lot of things. Also, the use cases can be on different engineering areas. It could be acoustics, it could be lighting design, it could be also in the more city perspective. It could be about waste management, energy efficiency. So. It could be up to the challenge, actually. It could be much more um, detailed. And if you look at the algorithms, I'm pretty sure that we have like amazing amount of algorithms that we didn't discover yet how to use in which area of the architecture. So I think every those six steps can be really open up to more and more questions. But sure, we are, we are the university, so we are asking these questions. We are opening new questions. So... I think uh, the justice question could be a new research project. <laughs> <laughs> and 
I guess it's going to be. Okay, so I have another super broad question yeah. now to just add to that. And this is going to be really the question all, to all three of you. Um, and the big question is, which I think is usually at the top of the mind for everyone, what is the future of prompt engineering? And the, I will pack it also with a couple of questions that we got. So uh, we there was a question to for Ajit to a little bit more uh, elaborate on autonomous ag agents. Mm -hmm. And I will pack this one together with a question about prompt engineering trends and also security. So just, you know, this is a lot to cover, but I think it really speaks to the point, what is the future and what are the trends there? So Ajit, maybe you would like to kick this off and Rohan would love to have your, you know, input to add. Sure. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. And I think that uh, I, I was listening to Dr. Aisha's presentation as well. And there are some aspects of that that already talked to some of the future of prompt engineering. Um, so, for example, we are looking at things where you can use prompts to generate whole virtual worlds. Correct. So it's like like you use a prompt and say that 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 you, you create ecosystems and they, they kind of interact with that. And in many ways, the autonomous AI agent idea is, is taking the idea of prompt engineering to a higher level of abstraction. So for example, I want to say that I want to book a holiday to Greece, but I don't want to tell it the sub steps of doing that. So what the prompt then does is effectively break it down into sub steps and try to execute each of those sub steps and then try to provide you a solution overall. There are a number of solutions to this. I mean, if you look at sorry, a number of um, people researching this idea. Uh, and if you look at autonomous AI agents, you'll find a whole bunch of research papers and, and things like that. So this for me is the future of prompt engineering that, that it, it then goes to the higher level of abstraction of problem solving, where you entrust AI to do uh, to solve a complex problem. Now, of course, you, you can come back with a lot of questions about this, correct? So how do you trust the output? To what extent can you allow it to autonomously execute something? And I was presenting uh, some ideas at the European Parliament yesterday, and I, I presented the same same idea. And I think that this 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 creates some questions in the minds of people. To what extent are we are we delegating our responsibility to to an agent but this is how i see the future and i think that is why i, I was sort of interested in uh, because we also have a, 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 a course on ai with digital twins you know, which also touches on some of the presentations which were which were in the last from dr aish with that so uh, that's how i see the future in that thank you so much uh any of you want to jump in and add your perspective so uh, yeah, hi Gorda. Uh, I just want to add like one more uh, direction of prompt engineering. One of the like a uh, very interesting aspect that I look for. So currently, we like I'm coming from like a background of recommendation system, and there were like lots of questions that like uh, how we can use utilize LLM as a recommendation system. One of the interesting aspect of using LLM or uh, uh, can we like you know generate user intent intent prompt. And what do I mean by user intent from? Currently, if you see like all the economy, it is it is like creator-based economy. What Netflix build for you, like what, what Netflix create a movie for you, you you consume it, right? What YouTube like create for you, you consume it. So what we have the inventory, that is the only thing we can recommend. But what if like tomorrow, if we can gather information from a user perspective, right? That user wants to see like this this kind of movie. Like suppose someone wants to see uh a uh, 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 next season of Breaking Bad, and if we are getting like that kind of like you know demand from user, can our 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 LLM system generate that 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 poster for user, right? And 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 we can like surface that poster to user and and predict the demand of that 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 particular content, and based on that we can tell our creator that yeah this is our user wants, and can you create like a, this content for the users? So. This is like a new aspect which can be like you know uh, integrated where right now it's a like creator based economy but can we make like consumer based economy where like consumer consumer user intention prompt can help us to generate like you know content and recommend content 
Thank you so much for this perspective. Um, like the whole time I'm kind of thinking Black Mirror episode, you know, when the content is literally generated for each of us and how, what future that holds. Uh, Aisa, anything you would like to kind of add to this? Yeah, I think for the future, if I um, add from the part of the designer's uh, look, I think right now we have a new tool. I think it's a very exciting tool that we can control or interact through the prompts, which can actually make our everyday life items or our living spaces more smarter. So we are not really getting smarter, but the things maybe will get smarter through the prompts and through the, this interaction. For example, what we designed before, like a chair, like let's say 40 to 40, 50 to 50 centimeters for one person, but we have smaller persons, bigger persons. So now I think we can design chairs which can understand the size of the person who is sitting on. So it can get smaller and bigger. So we will, I think, have uh, a lot of new designs and um, we will control our own items, I think, through that uh, prompt engineering. And I, I'm really looking forward to what will come. This is fantastic. I, I saw, I probably can't pull it from my head, but I know it was in Denmark, but there was first modular sofa designed and the hoops and loops they went through, but it's a sofa you just pack like Ikea and you can carry it. And it was done by AI and very smart prompting and bunch of experiments. So now a little bit about prompting. So I'm going to drop in the chat for everyone, uh, something what Rohan just shared with me regarding hallucinations. So I saw it was also like one of the kind of underlying in comments, you know, that when we talk about personalization, we talk about buildings, we talk, you know, any system which kind of starts understanding us and especially also biases, you know, on societal level. Um, I would like to really bounce this to all three of you. Anything that you've seen um, working regarding hallucinations or maybe any perspective that you would think that people should maybe have an alternative look into this. Um, let's start with Ajit again, if it's okay with everyone. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, so thank you for that. So I think that like, like I shared in my presentation, I, I sp we spent a lot of time in mitigation patterns, correct? So what the mitigation patterns are exactly to overcome this idea of hallucination. Now, I don't like the word hallucination. To my mind, actually, the word hallucination is uh, is the actual advantage of uh, AI, generative AI. Uh, I, I mean this very specifically. So for for that, if you if you are working with an artist, if you are working with a creator, they do have a tendency to go off track and 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 do different things and things like this. And this is a part of the creative process, correct? If we kill that, then we get something very 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 boring, so to speak. Yes. So I mean, this is where I think that we should appreciate the 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 ability of generative AI to actually hallucinate and use that as, as one of the main USPs of generative AI. Because if you take it to the extreme, other extreme level, then you are getting to a rule-based system, correct? In which you have to pre-program every possible scenario. Um, and that's not useful at all. So in my mind, it's two things. First of all, we need to accept that there is hallucination from from generative AI and that it's that that it's 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 adds value. And the second thing is that we need to build our own mitigation patterns as we, we talked about in our our strategy. Uh, and they are very technical to my work, correct? So I am I mean, Dr. Ice would have a different set of mitigation ideas. And this is the classic thing when you see all those examples of well, five-legged horses, for example, correct? I mean, you see this on, 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 on generative AI all the time, that it does mistakes which, which you wouldn't expect humans to do. But it is, it is fine once you accept that, that it is work in progress, it is not the final output, then this is, it's an attitude change from our side. Yeah, thank you so much for the science fair. I was just uh, recently saw a post where someone uh, thought that hacking, you know, uh, custom instructions on ChatGPT by saying, hey, rate my response on the accuracy that that uh, solves hallucinations. So just like, let's leave it at that. But yeah, we need a little bit more than that. And that leads also to some hallucinations. Uh, Rohan, so you shared this resource uh, and I dropped it in the chat. Um, specifically with the user personalization, um, 
anything like from your perspective, like, um, you, you know, you would like to touch on hallucinations, but also specifically for your session, I saw quite a lot of comments about user data privacy. Uh, so anything you want to dive into that, um, that would be fantastic. Yeah, thank you so much, Gurta. So yeah, I completely agree. And that's why my most of the presentation was like, you know, uh, fairness, ethic, ethics and responsible AI. Uh, so first, like we, 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 we talk about hallucination. I, I completely agree, right? These systems do generate hallucination. And as uh, uh, Dr. Joskar said that uh, we, 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 there is only certain extent we can mitigate hallucination. I think one of the important uh, tool we have to mitigate hallucination is human, right? So we we keep like human experts in the system and we don't want to remove them. So that can help us a lot. You you previously talked about black mirror, which is some sort of give like a negative image to like a, a LLM based recommendation system. But so, so some of the positive image I want to like uh, the, the field I work in like mental health, right? Where there is a, especially if we talk about like, you know, LMIC country, like low median income country where people don't have access to mental health. Like they don't have access properly to like you know general health like just forget about mental health and if the if the we can generate like you know a curated content or a curated stress program for those users where we don't have like you know uh, proper resources there and those like generated re resources can be vet by these experts that can reduce way large amount of like you know uh, a burden on our like you know existing resources and uh, assisting you know experts so we can actually use our expert knowledge to mitigate the hallucination that is the first thing and de definitely uh when we talk about like privacy like pri user privacy and biases that is like extremely extremely important when we work in like this sensitive field called mental health right so we want to make sure that like we the the, the LLM models we, which we are using are fine tuned. They they run in like some sort of isolations, and the data we are feeding is like you know completely uh, anonymized and like cannot be like you know identified that easily. So we we when we try to build a system like we we want to make sure that uh, our system uh, has only knowledge what it is required to answer the user and it should not like train on that information which can identify someone's some users like you know personal information so that's why like uh, we we focus more on like you know uh, building in-house model and like fine-tuning like uh, not using like all the like open open source or like you know open models like chat gpt and and if we use it like make sure that we we, we test it very properly before deploying it so I think those those are the things we can take care of. Like uh, uh, obviously, like uh, not sharing like user personal information, using some kind of like you know encryption methods and like de-identification method to to hide like all those sensitive information. And uh, obviously, for the hallucination, always like get it checked by like an expert human, so we can make sure that our use uh, our, our system is not hallucinating the content. Yeah, thank you so much. Um... Before I ask Dr. Glass, um, so I will just throw a question, but uh, then I will bounce to Ryan. Uh, I'm very curious, uh, you know, to hear from you in a second about how, what do you see architects? How do they react to AI coming? Because I know, like from experience, architects are a little bit slow with adopting newest technologies. I remember in university playing with guns. Um, but yeah, just what you are seeing in the field, or maybe just if you could touch on that, um, how this the landscape is looking. Are you asking to me? I yes, it was sorry. Asked, that's why I didn't uh, hear the beginning of the question. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, so the question is really what you are seeing uh, seeing in the field, like how architects or designers or urban landscape designers adapting AI and this is also in in general the following question I will want to ask all of you is really how is professional landscape looking do you really prompt engineers get 350k a year like what Anthropic advertised so before we get to that um, personally very curious how is adoption in a design and architecture community 
what I see in uh, Hamburg, for example, around the university and also the, um, around the industrial partners, actually the adoption was very, very fast. It was super fast than I thought. Like when we started to teach about the prompts and the generated images, it was, I think, like last, last year, in the beginning of last year. So we were uh, writing the code, what we want, as a, what we want to see on the prompt. And that was the first touch from the architects that opened the code and just write the sentence. So I think also in between this digital world and the design world is through the prompts, I think, coming more closer because a lot of architects or designers actually wanted to learn a lot about the coding or the background of the programs that you use, like uh, Grasshopper, I don't know, other 3D Max, a lot of Revit, a lot of edge architecture. I remember those. <laughs> are written by computer scientists or programmers. So architects also wanted to know because the more that you knew about the code, you could also enhance your design in a way that you can also modify through the code and the computation. So I think with the prompt engineering, it's much more clear to someone that is, has no idea about coding. Uh, then you can ask ChatGPT about the code what does it mean in this code can you generate me more or in other code generators so i think um it will be much more used actually and during the architects for sure it is uh, i don't know right now the discussion is a lot about also the energy efficiency and for the green technologies uh, so designers are really taking care of this like if generating is what what causes us generating actually for the environment and for everyone. So that is a discussion going on, but otherwise the prompting and the, what prompt engineering can actually provide to architects is I think awesome. Yeah, actually to your point, I'm just pulling out the, actually one of the first comments which popped that two days ago, The Verge reported Google is trying to add AI to their search engine, but it could take as much electricity as Ireland. What kind of job security can we expect when the face of this as prompt engineers? So I think this is going to be the transition to the question I popped before. Like, where do you see this? Like if folks want to, you know, get into this space and actually land a job, um, what should we do? Where do we start? And what is actually the security going forward with this type of path? All right, let me let me answer that again. Sure. First. Yes. So I think that many cases people look at it as, as one thing, correct? So for example, when I look at what was nanotropic, I'm I'm sure it is much more than just creating the prompt because yes. it really requires you to understand the ecosystem behind that. Which which brings me to the same question that if I were to do what Dr. Ayase is trying to do, I wouldn't be very successful at that because I do not know her domain and vice versa. Uh, and I think that this is very important to understand understand where your your knowledge is uh, is important but um sorry uh, can you recap your question again what you were asking exactly uh, yeah so um yeah the people were asking there was like multiple oh, yes. questions regarding that yeah. so basically like this path as a career like what is the yeah. security and i think the question regarding electricity yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah 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 that's right that's why i was trying to look into that now let me addre address that question regarding electricity and i think that people um look at it from from a monolithic perspective they look at large in large language models correct there's a certain mm -hmm. amount of research which says that that actually might 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 diverge in the future so if you look at something from La, like llama 2 from 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 meta or facebook correct? Correct. the significance of llama 2 is that it's actually in three flavors that is large medium small so that means you don't need you can have a small model running inside your inside your own firewall uh, and and can do a, a more focused GPT type uh, result. Now, obviously, it's not a large language model, meaning it won't do everything, but it might be well good enough for your purpose. Now, if you contrast that in the early days, you had Bloomberg GPT, correct? So obviously, if you're Bloomberg, if you have got a lot of money and you've got a lot of data, uh, you, you can do this. You can create your own Bloomberg GPT. But, but I think that that strategy now 
uh, may not be what other people will take. They will look at other ways of of sort of building a smaller, like if you look at RAG, R-A-G, correct? Retrieval Augmented Generation. If you look at those sort of things, I appreciate that they're not prompt engineering, correct? So they're not strictly prompt engineering, but in my mind, the whole ecosystem is a part of that. So if you, if you go for RAG, if you go for something else, you are then augmenting that LLM with something else, with your own data. And, and that might be, well, the way to go. You know, and then you have prompt engineering on top of it. So some of these problems, they are they, they make the headlines, but there are solutions to them. This is my conclusion. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we are just momentarily going into coffee break. I think everybody just needs to debrief. But Rohan, I just want to very, very quickly get your two points really on, on this question, what you're seeing and also headspace, you, you know, as a company embracing prompt engineering. Yeah, that's, uh, uh, I completely agree with uh, Dr. Joker that uh, obviously like uh, there are various specific, like not, not every company is Google first, like they are like 1% of the company that, that utilize this amount of, and obviously they are making lots of effort to make it like, you know, carbon neutral using lots of like renewable energy, but that that's a different talk together. If we talk about like specific industry, like Headspace, right? we we see like there is a huge shortage of like you know expert who to address like mental health and mental health like is obviously healthcare in the united states not something like everybody can afford right and uh, it should be a right not a privilege and uh, if we can have like a some kind of system that can help us that, that can help us to uh, provide uh, you know some kind of expert guidance or like generate some kind of uh, content that can be broadcast to large and that that can be scaled to large amount of user that should be definitely done and we what we are offsetting here like we are offsetting like you know obviously like uh, lots of other costs that are associated with like you know lots of administrative costs that that comes into the picture when someone wants like certain kind of healthcare or someone wants to like you know visit to a doctor or something like that so uh, there are like lots, like obviously in in the one space we having like uh, these large language model, especially during the training we we spend lots of energy in it. But obviously in the fine tuning we do not require that amount of energy. And over the time, if you see the amortized cost of it, like it will reduce over the time. Yeah. Like we don't want to like you know train from scratch every day, and we will be utilizing user knowledge and user feedback to uh, improve this system. So I, I think that on the longer run, these system definitely can help us uh, a lot to reduce overall cost. And obviously like we don't need like, you know, large language model for every application, maybe medium or small scale model also can help for a specific application. Yeah, exactly. Thank you yeah. so much. Um, thank you so much, all three of you. This was really fascinating, insightful, and I can't wait to delve into each of your content and maybe some courses who knows um so now we're going to go into the break i need coffee i go i guess you know listeners also need to get ready for a couple more hours of content so again thank you so much and bye bye thank you so i'm going to log off now from the from yes. the system yes thank, <laughs> thank you. you thank you very much Have a nice okay thank you coffee break everybody
Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the session. Uh, first question to all of you. How are you feeling? How are you enjoying this conference? I got coffee, so I'm in Central Europe. It's late, but I need coffee. So let me know what are you drinking? What are you enjoying? And if you're enjoying this conference. So we are going to continue right now. And we are going to hear from Elliot. Sorry, for El Eric. Elliot. And Eric Elliot is a pioneering force in the tech world, having contributed to platforms like Adobe Creative Cloud and YouTube, my favorite platform, Artist Page. He's been a tech lead on projects used by major media outlets like NBC and SPN, learning, earning a web nomination for his team's AI-driven work. Eric is also the inventor of Pseudolang, a pseudocode language seamlessly understood by GPT-4. Recently, he was featured in the AI documentary Cyborg Society. So everybody, I'm excited to bring to you Elliot, uh, Eric Elliot. My apologies once again. And let's kick Hello. this off. My name is Eric Elliot, and welcome to Better Prompting with Pseudocode. Um, we're just going to jump right into it, uh, get busy. I want to thank Maxim, Eric, and Dan for organizing this conference. Um, this industry is very new, so it's really cool for all of us to get together and share our knowledge with each other like this. Um, it's kind of a rare, cool opportunity. Uh, so thank you very much. <laughs> and um, I'm just going to start with a little bit of a backstory. All right. So I got access to GPT-3 um, in the summer of 2020. And I started playing around with it and exploring its capabilities. And I was really impressed. And um, one of the first things that I decided to do was see if it could write code. So um, I figured out pretty quickly it can write code. I, I had it writing JavaScript functions and stuff like that. And um, and I, it wasn't long before I, I realized like it needed a little bit of help writing functions. So I decided to help it. And I decided to use pseudocode to try to express like what I wanted it to do. And it turned out that works pretty well. And it improved the output quality quite a bit. So um, I've been prompting AI language models with pseudocode since 2020. And um, I've learned quite a lot about it. Um, Fast forward, ChatGPT dropped in November, and then several months later, uh, we got GPT-4 access. And um, when I started playing around with GPT-4, I realized not only can this write code, but um, if you give it the right prompt, it can write code at the level of a human senior engineer. And that's pretty extraordinary. That's, that's incredible. So... Um, I started using it quite a bit for AI-driven development. And um, around the same time, a friend of mine, Jake Brookman, tweeted, um, tweeted about his uh, pseudocode programming language called Jargon that he'd been using with GPT-4. And um, I'd been prompting with pseudocode for years, and I'd learned a lot about prompting and a lot about prompting with pseudocode specifically. So I decided maybe it would be useful if I did the same kind of thing and wrote about uh, this programming language I've been using called Pseudoling and uh, wrote about that and posted on GitHub. So I did that. I went to GPT-4 and I had it help me write the specification for Pseudoling. And in the process, it even invented a new feature called um, uh, function modifiers, which I think are extremely useful and I use them all the time. Um, so pretty cool. Uh, that worked out really well. And um, me and my teams have been using um, Pseudolang to build all kinds of interesting things, both interactive chat bots and also programs that do that, that write programs, <laughs> so, uh, which we call metaprogramming, and then AI-driven development, AI-driven, test-driven development. And... Um, the AI-driven development has increased the productivities of our productivity of our teams so much that it has increased our output by 
10 to 20 X. So a 10 to 20 times increase in output. That's more than an order of magnitude. And when you're talking about an order of magnitude productivity difference, what that does for a team is it opens up uh, new possibilities. Uh, you can start to take on way more, um, way more challenging scopes uh, and, and projects become possible that were not possible before because of resource constraints. So in my opinion, this development is one of the most important things that, have, that has happened to human productivity in the history of humanity uh, um, since the computer itself. Uh, I don't think there's anything else that even comes close to comparing to the potential productivity benefit of AI language models. And, and I think that pseudocode plays a very important role in that. And uh, so... Um, to explain that, first I should probably explain what pseudocode is, right? So pseudocode is kind of like a programming language, but it, originally it wasn't intended to be a programming language. It was intended to communicate with humans, communicate ideas about programs to other humans who may then go and implement those programs and uh, create uh, working stuff with them. Um, so... It turns out you can take that same pseudocode and paste it into a large language model and it actually runs. Like it infers the definition of things and, and it can run it like a computer can run a real programming language. Um, so now our pseudocode language is a real programming language. The, the specification is the code which is pretty phenomenal that the, uh, and that's how it's been able to unlock those 10 X or 20 X productivity increases because the pseudocode is the code. Um, yeah. So why pseudocode? <laughs> why not just use natural language, right? That's a common question that I get. Uh, it turns out there's lots of answers to that question. Uh, so let's start with some of those. Right. First, you get a higher percentage of accurate responses. So the percentage of responses that are correct and accurate increases by about 10 to 14 percent. Uh, I'm not going to cite sources here in this talk, but if you go to the pseudolink GitHub repository um, and scroll down to the readme, there are sources, there are papers linked in the readme that, uh, that show some of these findings. And these findings agree with my own findings. So the findings in the papers uh, directionally agree with my own findings um, using pseudocode prompting. So very interesting stuff. Uh, I think that one of the reasons for that is because when you are prompting a language model, it's going to be contextually aware. or And if you don't give it context, it will infer context on its own. So what I mean by that is if you were to ask a language model, why is the sky blue? Uh, and then ask that same question, but with more context. So you can say, as a physicist speaking to uh, college graduate students, um, why is the sky blue? And then it will give you potentially a much more detailed technical answer to the question than if you just ask it, why is the sky blue without any context? Uh, it might infer that you're talking to a five-year-old and give a very, <laughs> very, ki very different kind of answer, right? Well, it turns out pseudocode gives it some contextual awareness for the kind of answer that you want. Um, when it sees curly braces, or uh, then it understands that this information is scoped together. The information inside the braces is scoped together. When it sees a variable, it understands this is state that it needs to pay attention to, and then it does, right? Um, so it, in that way, it is able to produce more accurate responses more often, um, which is extremely useful, of course, right? Um, but uh, again, it also has, it, it consumes fewer tokens. So in our findings, um, in converting natural language prompts into pseudolang, 
we've found that we can reduce the token usage by um, 20 to 30 percent, which is pretty significant considering that tokens cost money. So in other words, you can reduce the inference cost of your program by 20 to 30 percent just by switching from natural language to pseudolang or some other pseudocode programming language that is token efficient. Uh, as far as I know, pseudolang is the most token efficient uh, pseudocode programming language for LLMs currently and uh, definitely uh, one of the richest and, and most, most robust in terms of functionality and features and stuff like that. So um, good choice for that kind of thing. Um, what else? You also get better output control. And what I mean by that is you can produce templates that can be used. So let me show you an example. Um, if we go over here, you can see this little test case description. This is a template that can be interpolated. So if we were, we could ask it to um, to give us written, like just natural language descriptions of all the test cases that it's going to create, and it would use that test case description in order to describe those test cases. And here it's using these things and the constraints associated with it to create unit test cases for this program that we created here. Um, so this is the given when should stuff that you saw up here in the test case description. So that's kind of cool. Um, another interesting thing that you can do is you can constrain to a particular typed data structure. So for example, over here, I have a little robot program that, uh, that uses commands. And those commands have types, and they have payloads. And some of those payloads are also strongly typed. Uh, so we can see. And there's also here another example of a response template. So this is an interpolated, uh, this is what the response is going to look like. Um, so here is an example of the payload types. So this is a strongly typed language. And, uh, and, and it can pay attention to those types and then produce correct outputs. So for example, if we tell it, please hand me the yellow ball from the table in front of you, our little robot first uh, issues a command look, and it looks at the table, and then it picks up the yellow ball from the table, and then it looks at the current user, and then gives the current user the um, yellow ball. So this is using those uh, strongly typed um, uh, data structures that we provided to it in pseudolang. Um, so kind of fun. So better output control, typed data structures, output templates, that kind of stuff. Um, it's a lot harder to get things working like that using natural language. But in pseudo, pseudolang, it's really, really easy. And in fact, it's so easy that I have an easier time with it uh, using pseudolang than, than with the function, um, the, the function features built into uh, some of the... <laughs> some of the large language model APIs. So um, yeah, it's, it's really, really nice. And you can see it, it does this pretty consistently. It's, it's, it's really good with it. Um, all right, so another advantage of uh, pseudocode programming language is that we get these visual structures that indicate scopes and stuff like that, which makes it easier for both humans and AI to parse and figure out which things should be grouped together and which things should be separate versus looking at uh, a big wall of paragraphs of text. Um, when it's scoped out like this, you can see where things start and where things end very clearly, uh, which is really nice. <clears throat> so visual structure. We also get composable prompts. So if we wanted to, we could take the state here and these favorites here. And in fact, if we wanted to shave tokens off of this, it would actually do that because spaces consume tokens. And as we indent multiple levels, we're wasting tokens on those spaces. So we could have specified this and even this entire state thing as their own interfaces and then compose those into this main interface. And that's completely doable in pseudo -ling. 
uh, and something that would be a good optimization if we were running out of tokens with this prompt. This prompt doesn't have that problem. We're not running out of tokens. So I don't see it as a problem here. But in my larger prompts, I definitely break them out into smaller things and compose them later. So we get composable prompts. Um, another interesting uh, thing that you get with pseudo pro pseudocode is really easy um, AI-driven development. So you basically, you can write something in pseudolang and then transpile to any other language. And the power of being able to write it in something like pseudolang, let me just show you a little example here. So there's this longest increasing subsequence algorithm that is pretty complicated. It's complicated enough that I know the algorithm, uh, but it would take me 20 or 30 minutes to get a working implementation of the algorithm because it's so complicated. There's lots of variables to keep track of. There's nested loops. There's lots of conditional statements that have to all be right in order for it to work. Uh, using the dynamic programming method uh, for the longest increasing subsequence algorithm. Um, or you can do it in pseudolang. And all you have to do in pseudolang is define what a subsequence is. So a sequence derived from the source uh, by selectively omitting elements without changing the order. And then we just give it a couple of reminders, return the whole subsequence, and remember, remember to backtrack. And that's all we need to get it to write this algorithm uh, and do a good job. And uh, so here we have an implementation of the longest increasing subsequence. So it turns that little bit of pseudolang into this big function here, where you can see um, the multiple levels of looping iteration and then multiple levels of if statements. So lots of multiple dependent conditionals and then more, more if statements at the end here, and then uh, another loop to um, backtrack and build a subsequence from our uh, dynamic programming array. So yeah, in other words, you can take something very little and turn it into something much more complex. And notice we also described a few, like told it how to do some unit testing here. This little bit, um, I call metaprogramming. Metaprogramming is where you write programs that write programs. So this is just a little bit of a program that tells it how to write unit tests and, um, and do it with right way. And then this transpile function, interesting thing about this is I didn't define this function anywhere. This function doesn't really exist. It just inferred it. It, inf it knows what transpile means, so it knows how to do it. So we just tell it transpile this to JavaScript with unit tests and it does, uh, and and this is the output, and here are our unit tests that it created. So um, this transpiling feature, uh, like I mentioned, has increased our productivity 10x or 20x on our teams. And I I, I run teams that build software, and um, and those teams are way more productive now uh, using pseudolang as the authoring language and then transpiling into languages like JavaScript and Python and, and so on. Um, so huge, huge, huge wins for productivity. OK. So AI-driven development. Another great feature is that pseudocode can democratize development because it's a lot easier to learn how to write this than it is to learn how to write this. Right. So in other words, it's easier to onboard new users into software engineering and development in general, and it democratizes the industry. Uh, it makes it a lot easier for people to produce software. And I think that that's really important um, because, you know, talent is kind of evenly distributed around the world, but opportunity isn't. Uh, and if we can onboard more people more easily, even people that don't have necessarily the resources to uh, find people to teach them programming. Maybe they don't have good uh, good school tracks teaching programming, um, but maybe they can get onboarded using pseudocode in uh, ChatGPT uh, and or or something similar. And that would be really great. That'd be a, a net win for the world, I think. All right, so just a little bit, just a little little bit of time left. So uh, pseudoling uh, has some programming paradigms that are really interesting. It's constraint based and. And you can see some, these are basically constraints. This is all it's, all we're telling it is the constraints. Uh, constraints are um, basically just rules. You can think of it as the rule book for how to produce the output that the language model is going to produce. 
Uh, and those rules can be both positive, so things that it should do, and negative, things that it should not do. Um, Constraint-based programming was inspired by Ivan Sutherland, 1961 and 1963, inventor of right, inventor of uh, of a lot of graphics programming things, direct interaction, VR headsets, and so on. And he's a genius. And the constraints basically, you could say, keep these lines parallel and move things around, and it would automatically solve and keep them parallel and stuff like that. Turns out the AI language model does that really, really well by itself, um, and, and it works really nicely. Um, and then we have interfaces, so it's very interface-oriented. As you can see here, um, most of this program is just the defining an interface. And one of the important parts of defining an interface is the commands here at the end. All right. Um, and uh, it's both functional and compositional, so you can compose it and stuff like that. Um, so let's talk about why pseudoling has the structure that it has. It starts with the preamble, which is very important for context and situational awareness. Like, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? Um, what are your what perspective should you speak from, right? And uh, what is the main job you're trying to do? And uh, that's really, really important. And then at the end, we have like the commands for the main interface um, and the initializer, so where it should start uh, in, in its job. And it turns out these are the really, really important bits, the end and the very beginning. And that's important because we have this thing called sparse attention, that I call sparse attention, right? Um, and uh, the paper... Uh, there's a good paper on this topic called Lost in the Middle, How Language Models Use Long Contexts. And the long and short of it is that uh, if you exceed the attention uh, span of the AI language model, then it's going to lose the stuff in the middle of your prompt. So it pays pretty good attention to the beginning of the prompt, which is like this bit here, which is super, super important. It also pays pretty good attention to the end of the prompt, which is this bit here, which is also very, very important. But it turns out that if it has those two things, it can mostly infer what to do in the middle. So um, with a pseudoling program, if you structure it correctly, this lost in the middle program affects you less than if you structure your programs differently. So uh, U-shaped attention, pay attention to that. Uh, that's another reason that uh, it's really important to have fewer tokens in your prompts, which is another reason to use uh, a pseudocode programming language like pseudoling, because you can reduce your token consumption 20 to 30% doing it. So um, really nice. Um, yeah. So some, stand, some common use cases for stuff like this. Uh, chat UIs like this one. This one is designing an interactive friend for um, things like character AI or video games and so on. And uh, what we do is we walk it through a couple of uh, commands, like we told it, randomize a talking dog chat bot, and then it creates the state necessary to do that. And then we go in and list the elements, which is just re rerunning the thing. I didn't realize I'd already done that. And then we craft the output. Um, and this is the final output. So you can have things that, that get built over time in like a chat session, and that works really well. Uh, good use case. Another really good use case is agents, um, because you can have different sub-agents that specialize in different things. So we use this a lot for application development. We have an agent that's really good at writing state management code. We have an agent that's really good at writing user interface components. We have another agent that's really good at project planning and, and um, project management tasks. And then we have this orchestrator agent that, that sees what needs to be done and then dispatches the correct agent to work on that thing. And I, I think that <clears throat> maybe uh, uh, GPT-4 needs a lot of babysitting when you're doing stuff like that. I think maybe the next generation will be able to... Uh, or the generation after that, maybe, will be able to create entire applications from a prompt, which would be amazing, really, really, uh, really, really amazing if it could do that. I think 
that is in the future. I think that's inevitable. It definitely will happen. Uh, it's just a matter of when it will happen. Um, all right. So, and like I said, the other major use case is transpiling and, and building stuff. Anyway, uh, that's about all the time we have left. I'm going to give hopefully a little bit, bit of uh, Q&A. Um, and uh, thank you all for taking a look. And uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of the conference. Have fun. I'll see you around. Thank you so much, Eric. I I think just looking from the chat, guys, I hope you all realize uh, how cutting edge these stuff are. Um, unfortunately, I have sad news. Uh, Eric is not going to be able to join the Q&A session happening later on. Um, uh, due to personal reasons. And, but actually what I thought to do, because yeah, the, these things are fascinating. So I can make you a promise that I'll reach out to Eric and maybe we could do a video together uh, explaining this more in depth. So fingers crossed for that, subscribe, like, and all those stuff. But I want to pull a couple of questions. And the reason I want to do that, that maybe, you know, I, I see conversations going in a chat and... I really enjoy your questions. So Darf Looper was asking, can pseudocode be used to better track the decision-making process and help find transparency in the black box? Can we create markers in the code to give results um, a followable logic path? Uh, if anyone you know, has awareness and would like to engage, please do that. A couple of other questions was also for Cohen. What is your opinion about writing pseudocode and abstract mathematical uh, notations? That's another idea uh, worth exploring. And by the way, I will pass uh, to uh, Eric all the questions that you had. Um, yeah, so I think what we're going to do now, we are going to go to the next session um, and we are going to hear from Rory Preddy and from Semantic Kernel. And Rory is a principal cloud advocate at Microsoft, where he employs his deep research skills to guide developers, developers, excuse me, through Microsoft's cloud platforms. Known for his engagement and humorous talks, he accumulated almost 30,000 followers on LinkedIn, and we will drop links to connect with Rory for you. Rory, Rory travels globally to empower developers to reach their full potential. So this is going to be another exciting talk. Um, I hope you're going to enjoy it. And please remember to post your- Welcome everyone. Question. Today, we've got an exciting session. We're gonna go through semantic kernel, teaching AI not to repeat, but complete. I'm Rory Preddy, Principal Cloud Advocate at Microsoft. And we're gonna go through some very uh, brief slides and then into a demo around this topic. So I'm going to give you an introduction to the history and also the movement of what generative AI is. We're going to look at how to utilize semantic kernel and also the uh, RAG pattern. Then we're going to look at using AI driven templates with the Azure developer CLR. So how did we actually get here? Now, it's important to understand that this industry has actually been driven since 2018 by something called the multimodal transformer architect. And in that, the multimodal transformer architect, you have the combining layer, visual embeddings, and text embeddings, and there's so many different nuances around that. What it basically does, it normalizes the weighting that you get when you train on image and also textual data. This has been around since 2018 and was introduced by the Google team as in the paper, the seminal paper, attention is all you need. And this opened up a whole world um, for us, Microsoft and Google and other companies around that. Because what we then did, we were given the ability to go in and create training architecture. So you can see here, this is a GPT-3 model training architecture. We've taken the, the data, and then we do data transformation with tokenization. We then do 
encoding and decoding into latent space. So we just create a GPU kind of like mindset. Hey, here's a, here's a universe of words. We use deep speed and zero to actually go in and do GPU uh, allocation. We train it and we trained it on the world's largest supercomputer on Azure. And then we have the foundation models. And what that gave us is the ability to take text and data um, we, we trained it up already, put it into a transformer model, and then it adapts to what our output was. So you can do question and answering, semantic analysis, information extraction, image captioning, object recognition, instruction followers, and everything that you, you've heard around um, the industry bragging about um, it with GPTs, though. But the problem is that people kind of have freaked out about that when they realize what it could do. We've got uh, some people saying um, it's good for humanity, same saying it's bad for humanity, some people saying it's useless, others saying it's capable. But, you know, there, there, there are some uh, uh, scary parts of it, but we are addressing that as Microsoft with responsible AI and going through testing processes to make sure that the people with the bad humanity and the useless and also the bad humanity and capable are not actually right though. AI will not take your jobs and will not enslave us because it unlocks new human potential and there's some very useful applications. And we believe that in um, no more than three years time, anything that is not connecting to AI will be considered broken and invisible. This is our, our prediction by one of our, our chief uh, data scientists, Sam Schlantz. And because we, we see this as the next evolution of uh, building blocks um, for dev tools and engineering approaches. So in the beginning, there was mainframe, then you had desktop, internet, mobile and cloud. The next, the next evolution of that ladder is AI. Uh, th there's a problem though, because we, you know, we, we say AI is the next evolution, but generative AI doesn't really have context of your data. So you aren't really a part of that. We train it and we train the GPT-3 model, but what about you and, and, and your interests and your data that you want to actually go and inspect though? Um, so it, it, for example, here is, does my health plan cover annual expenses? And it says response, I'm an AI language model and don't have access to specific inf information about your uh, health plan. And then we've seen the industry kind of uh, immediately pivot to try and get your data into uh, those, those mechanisms though. So Microsoft has had access to GPT-4 more than anyone else. We've partnered with OpenAI. And as a result, we've created the ability to, uh, to orchestrate that AI using the Copilot stack. So you've got your apps and you've got your plugin capabilities, you've got your Copilots uh, and Windows Copilot, Office Copilot. Then you've got your AI orchestration, and then you've got your foundational models and your AI infrastructure. Now, the, the co-pilots are extensive, and we've been rolling these out as part of the, the Microsoft uh, stack to multiple times. Even you know, three, three years ago, we, we rolled out GitHub Copilot, which uses a generative a model, and also we, we gave it your data, which is the uh, Visual Studio code and Visual Studio, your, your text that you, you, you're working on, the programming text that you are working on. But then we, we, we actually added a few more. Now, I personally have 10 of these robots floating around on my PC on Microsoft Bing, Edge, Word, uh, Outlook, Excel, PowerPoint, Teams, Business Chat for Teams also, Windows Copilot, and all of the other ones that I haven't even get, got to start with it, though. And how we did this is we used the uh, retrieval augmented generation pattern. It's, a, it's an old pattern, actually. It's, it's a five to six years old already. And what this does, it grounds intelligent applications on existing data. So you've got your app uh, user experience and uh, user interface. Then you've got your orchestrator. In our case, I'm going to focus on semantic kernel. And then you've got Azure Cognitive Search, which will go in and it will um, uh, index your data. Because we want to be able to retrieve that data quickly. And then you can put your data sources into Azure Cognitive Search. And then once it does that, the uh, the general model goes and queries your cognitive search, though, and it's uh, uh, augmented generation around that. So you retrieve and you augment um, with the, uh, those queries, though. You also want to give it the, the ability to actually go retrieve it, though. So what you do is that when you say to go retrieve that information, you use plugins. Here, for example, is uh, plugins, and you've got brainstorm, email generation, short poem, story gen, and translate. We're going to go through some of those in the, the demo, though. But it allows your, your your system, your orchestrator to go in, hey, I'm going to use the best tool for the job. In this case, um, 
can you write me a short poem about living in Dublin, Ireland, and then create a story based on the poem? And then we'll say, sure. And what it does, it takes the, uh, the rag pattern and goes, finds those necessary plugins that you need and uh, kind of collects them and then goes and calls your cognitive uh, 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 search data. So let's go through a nice example. It starts with a user ask. So in that example here, we had um, create me a, a short poem about living in Dublin, Ireland, and then create a story based on that poem. So we create a poem and then create a story. So in that case, we're gonna uh, we know what the ask is. We're going to follow some really nice architectural principles. We're going to emphasize, define, ideate, prototype, and test. So emphasize, we actually know what the story is. And we're going to take that story and put it into a planner. And the planner is going to go, OK, I know what you want. And I'm going to go through the necessary skills um, or plugins to go in and retrieve that. We're then going to go define it. And how we define it is we go and gather the plugins, gather the memories, and then the data APIs. We're going to ideate by retrieving that information running it and returning it back to the, uh, the caller. Then we're going to prototype um, by putting that into a application, and then we're going to test. And you can see here this, the, the pipeline steps are a little bit further to what a normal prompt uh, for OpenAI will be, because what you're doing really is you're asking the person to come up with the dream, the idea that they have of what they want, and then to go forward uh, with that. Though. So that's all the slides and introduction I want to do. Next, I'm going to show you a little demo with a uh, semantic kernel, though. So let's go into here, uh, into Visual Studio. So I've loaded the semantic kernel tools, which are Visual Studio extension. And when I load those tools in, I've also loaded the semantic kernel project. In the links below, you can access that project. So the project has uh, a few folders here. And we're very interested in two folders, the sample folder here. Um, if you can click over, over there, you get a lot of samples. Um, and inside the sample folder, we have apps and skills. You can go into the semantic kernel uh, extension here, and you'll see the skills, and we've renamed these recently to plugins. But plugins and skills um, used uh, interchangeably here, they're uh, very simple. They're just prompts. So if I go into the joke skill here, let's just close that, and it says write exactly one joke or humorous story uh, about the topic below. And joke must be G-rated, workplace, family, safe, no sexism. Um, and, uh, and no bigotry. Uh, be creative and funny, I want to laugh. Incorporate the style suggestion if provided. So what we're doing here is we're, we're meta-prompting. So I've already connected this to my AI endpoints on Azure OpenAI. Um, and if I click on settings, I can actually see here, if I click on a function here, uh, function skills here, uh, function good started. OK, so some of the, the joke one doesn't have that, but you can do max tokens, temperature, top P, and we've let everything to be the same. So let's go and test uh, joke. Oh, there we go. Max tokens, 1,000. So let's, let's click on uh, joke here. It's going to prompt you here, max style. OK, I'm going to go uh, informal style, informal. And then the joke, I'm going to say, uh, I want to do dragons. OK, it's going to go in there, and it's going to call, open out. Now, remember, what we're doing is we're augmenting. We're getting data back, and, and we're trying to actually see how far we can go uh, with the prompts here. So it took uh, four seconds here, 84 input tokens, output tokens, 26. Why don't dragons make good company employees? Because every time they're asked to fire someone, they take it literally. So that's great and everything. But I want to make a children's book of that. So how do I do that? How do I augment that and use the planner to go in and collect all the skills at once? Now, you can go into semantic kernel here. And now you can see here uh, under planners, it says create a plan. So I'm going to go to create a plan. I've, uh, I've got a planning uh, folder here already. Select plan folder. And now I'm going to add the, let's go into here, the, the writer skill and then the fun skill. Because these are, these are skills, but they're actually plugins. And similar to the OpenAI plugins, they're actually written in the, the OpenAI uh, standardization for plugins. So I've got, OK, okay. Uh, enter the plan name, and I'm going to call this uh, kids books, uh, kids joke book, joke book. And let's just uh, move that space there. There we go. And now I'm going to give it a goal. And this is where the, uh, the rag pattern really comes in there. I'm going to go uh, write a joke for children 
on dragons and create a short book on the joke. So it's going to it's going to use two skills there or plugins. It's going to use the writer skill to go and write a book and then the joke skill to get all that information and all the time using the rag pattern to go get that information from the previous one and daisy chaining it across those. So let's hit enter here. And now it's going to go in there and uh, create uh, my plan. Let's hit refresh here. Sometimes it does take a, a, a few seconds here. Uh, let's go uh, create plan here. There we go. Kids, kids joke book here. And then we got, okay, write a joke for dragons. And then it says selected skills, what we want to do. We don't have to worry about what to do here. We can just go, uh, we see here that you're going to go and that. So the model here, the plan steps is fun, skill, joke, and then write a story, score, story gen, and then novel outline. So it's got three uh, that we're going to use. Now we can execute that plan. And that's going to go into OpenAI, and I don't have to worry about taking prompts and running with them and, and doing all of that, though, because it's, it's much easier just to uh, have a plan. It's called goal-orientated programming, um, and then run with that and get the system to, to assist me here. So the first thing, the joke came through. So let's go in and see a generated joke. So uh, outputs joke. Let's go open that a little bit there. Okay, so let's go through. Remember, this is a, it's a lot of information. And uh, plan steps, fun school. Way too much information for me to, to see in the, the chat, uh, chat though. Um, but it's got the joke, and now it's going to write the story gen and then and the novel outline around that. Let's, let's go and see and see what the, uh, the output is of that. Oh, there we go. The input, uh, this is a, the, the state for the novel outline says the humorous take on why dragons should not make good company uh, employees. Let's go see if we can see the, uh, so that was the joke that we did previously. Uh, and then here we have the plan results. In this chapter, we meet our protagonist, a well-known but somewhat native HR manager called Susan, and it goes there all the way through to employees and dragon, exactly what we saw uh, there before though. So how do I get started with this and put it into an application? Now, if you remember the, uh, the, the, the listing here under the, the files, under samples, there was something called Book Creator Web App. And there's a lot of other nice little apps there. So let's go open up the, uh, the Book Creator. So let's go into here. Um, and I've got a nice TypeScript and uh, React application here. And I've got a nice little uh, model here that says the ask. Uh, the hooks, it will go call the semantic kernel. And then the components here, create book and uh, the task button. So let's, let's go into here, and now we want to start this up. So the first thing we want to do, now we, we want the semantic kernel to be managed by a separate process. You can actually put it into a web app also. But I'm going to go into uh, one of the, the other pr uh, processes, and I'm going to go and create a kernel HTTP server. It's basically just a REST server that takes the OpenAI specification and sends it back to JSON when you call a skill. So let's go into file, open recent, and I want to go into kernel HTTP server here. Now I'm just going to go there, func start, and that's going to take all the skills and it's just going to provide a REST services. So you can actually go in uh, and, and call that those REST services here. I also want to go and go back to my application. So let's go file, uh, open recent, and then here's my book creator. So let's see how we can do that. It's all written in TypeScript. You can go in and inspect it uh, if you want here. And I want to go yarn start. So this is going to connect to OpenAI, and it's going to use the semantic kernel that we've had there in that HTTP kernel server. And that is a listing of all the skills that we've really tested uh, now, though. So uh, I've already kind of set it up here. I've got my OpenAI key. I've got my uh, endpoint here. And then I've got uh, my endpoint here. Now it's going to connect to that. Look how many functions that this uses here. Book ideas, novel ideas, create book, summarize, translate, and rewrite. I don't have to worry about uh, chaining them all of there and getting the data wherever I want, though. All I have to do is have have an idea, a dream, a, a, a kind of an end goal that I want to do. Okay, create a book. Uh, so um, what is the topic that we want? We want to go dragons in the workplace. Uh, dragons in the workplace. So let's go get some ideas here. 
So let's click through that. Now it's going to go and it's going to get the book ideas. Um, and at the same time, it's using the planner service here and also the semantic kernel. Now, the planner service can also use embeddings. So you can actually take data and you can pop it into a smaller model and you can get those embeddings. We haven't done that uh, right now, but I've got dragons at the desk, coffee, bre coffee breathing dragon. So let's go to coffee breathing dragon, get ideas here. Um, and now it's going to take that information and using the rag pattern, transfer that data, and it could be a database, could be anything that you actually retrieve here, the office dragon. Yes, let's go create a book. At the same time, the samples is pretty fantastic because you can see the processing. So you can actually go show process and it's going to create a book. Now, this is going to take a minute. We already saw that with the plan. It's going to take a few seconds here. Um, and uh, oh, there we go. It's going to go uh, to that API there, uh, create plan, create an H an eight page children's book called The Office Dragon about in a world where everyone has a personal dragon. Meet Spark and it's going to go through that though. And then we'll get uh, the, the dragon for that. Now there's quite an, an, a nice number of samples that you can go to. My favorite is that there's a GitHub sample that goes in and creates a, a, a chatbot of all of the underlying GitHub M markdown files that you have. So you, if you have a, a, a project that you have that you're working in collaborative with other developers or uh, your company, you can create a bot that has ingested all of that information um, and helped you create uh, a rag pattern for that. Okay, let's go see if our book here, and here's our book. We've got our book here. Uh, let's go, and uh, let's go at the top here. Uh, let's go show book here. There's our book. We've got a kid's book here, and we can go in and use Dali to actually go in and, uh, and, and manifest pictures for that though. So this is the, the, the one show. Now, I know what you're thinking, Rory, this is not really based on real world. The, the, the solution to that is that we have real world templates that I'm going to showcase right now. So let me go back into Microsoft uh, PowerPoint here. So we finished with the demo now. Now let's look at how to build some advanced templates with the Azure Developer CLR. So first of all, going to the cloud with some of these architectures is very difficult. You have to understand which cloud service to use, libraries, local dev environment, provision infrastructure, roles and permissions, infrastructure as code, run locally, deploy to cloud, monitor the observability. I can't even say that. CI and CD pipeline. All we want is to take a application like we have and uh, to pop it on there to call Azure OpenAI and, and maybe a cognitive service. So surely someone has done that before because I don't want to have to worry about that as an architectural diagram. It, it's, just, it's too much for me to do. So we, we, we partnered with the Azure um, team to create the Azure Developer CLI journey. And what that does, it just means that you can download or you can actually, it will pull in the, uh, the project for you. You can go AZD in it. It will create your project structure for you. You can go AZD up. Um, which will then, similar to Terraform, bring up all your provisions, um, pipeline config, which will go in and then create your GitHub actions automatically for you to build your application. And then AZD Monitor will go in and monitor your application. So let's see, how, how do you get started? So if you, you go to uh, HTTPS azure.github.io forward slash awesome AZD. You can scat, um, scan that QR code also, and it'll give you the template library of all of the advanced OpenAI templates. And one of the ones, the templates I want to show you today is the chat GPT plus enterprise data with Azure OpenAI and cognitive search. Remember what I said earlier that we wanted a, a little bit more of a meaty example that we want to go through uh, with that though. Now, I recently had the experience of having to need to use also th this awesome template um, uh, within four hours. I was called on to speak at the United Nations on anti-corruption uh, hackathon. And in that, I said to myself, wow, I need to actually teach them how to use AI to go in and teach and train people on how to promote anti-corruption in, um, in the public and private sector. So I downloaded the ChatGPT and Enterprise uh, Data in Azure Open AI and Cognitive Search um, template. And within a space of four hours, I had taken all my documents, and I'm going to show you in the demo here, and created 
you can see here, um, uh, reference the documents that I've uploaded and find ways that AI can prevent and detect corruption. Now, what it's going to do is I've uploaded those documents and it goes and scans them into cognitive search. You can see there the anti-corruption module six discusses and it goes through all of that and then says citations and it includes citations. Let me, let me show you exactly how I managed to do that. So let's, uh, let's get out of here. Let me go to Microsoft Edge. Uh, bring that in here, and now I want to go into the UN uh, ODC. There we go, my little chat here. Now this is um, running in uh, Blazor. It's a C sharp based application here, and um, I've loaded the documents in here. Uh, I actually loaded them up as part of the AZD init uh, and app uh, lifecycle. So it goes in there and, and scans them. You can actually go in there and select the PDF documents. And you can see that this is all of the documents that, that, you know, four hours before I actually deployed it, they had given me and I had said, okay, cool. How do I teach and train this here? So I've got all of the material here. And then I can go into the uh, chat here and I can say chat with your data. What is corruption? Now it understands uh, the basics of what corruption is, though, or anti-corruption, but it doesn't know the, the reference material that I've loaded into cognitive search. So what is corruption here? And it says I'm generating an answer. And this is exactly, it's using semantic kernel to go into the plan, ex exactly like we wrote the, the joke book, except here it's using my own data, using the rag button. So it says corruption, it's associated with integrity and ethics, and it goes through all of that. And then the citation there, and now I can actually progress through that. And how I did that, you remember the, 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 the plans and the skills there? I actually wrote here um, a skill, and, and it defines you're a system system that helps people understand corruption, and then it can actually go in and look at the supporting content if I, I needed it here. So this really is the rag pattern come to fruition, though. We saw earlier that how you can do a very basic joke book, um, and we use the semantic kernel planner to go in and string all of those uh, planning um, uh, uh, skills together. And now we've seen here that you can actually do the same, except you can go to, and let's go see here, uh, awesome AZD. Let's go open here. Uh, awesome AZD templates here. Now I want to search for open AI, uh, hit enter. And you'll see there, you've got all of those uh, nice little templates. And I want to show you, this is the, the template that I use now, Chat GPT and Enterprise Data with Azure OpenAI and Azure Cognitive Search. You can go in there, and now to execute this, all you have to do is install the Azure CLI, and then I'll show you here, and it goes through all of that there. But it'll give you the instructions. This is how simple it is, though. Let's, let's not go run locally. There we go. Azure AZD init and it gives you that template. And then you can actually go AZD up, and it'll deploy to Azure. And what it'll deploy is the ability to actually use cognitive search. Let's just go a little bit faster. It'll take the uh, Azure cognitive search there, and then it'll use the RAG pattern with Azure OpenAI. It'll retrieve all of that information, just like we saw with daisy chaining uh, with, that, um, with the semantic kernel and how to actually get through that. So that's everything I wanted to show you today. You can get started uh, on the uh, QR codes that I'm about to give you here uh, from uh, current slide. There we go. Let me just minimize that. And um, I'm going to leave you with a, a very easy QR code here. I gave you the previous one here. And you can scan that. And that's semantic kernel. You can go to aka.ms forward slash semantic dash kernel. All of the demonstrations I've showed you are also there, along with um, you can go to uh, awesome AZD. And then you can actually start implementing uh, the semantic kernel along with the RAG uh, pattern there to go in and to teach an AR uh, not, uh, not to repeat, but to complete. Thank you, everyone. You can follow me on Twitter and on LinkedIn. I'm Rory Preddy, and you've been a gracious audience. Cheers, everyone. Wow, Rory, thank you so much. This was incredible. I love your energy. And I think what we are going to do is really fire chat in a Q&A session because there was some specific questions and I think right into this conference, we can dive into specificity of things. But before we do that, I want you to welcome our last speaker for this session. 
which is Eric Allen. And Eric is really fascinating use case. Aaron Allen is versatile developer advocate at Datadog with an extensive background that includes roles as consultant, VP, and adjunct professor. A Boston resident, he has interviewed around 1,000 developers and is passionate about accessibility, user experience, and, of course, AI. When he's not diving into TypeScripts, you might find him enjoying a craft beer, nice, or capturing the world through his lens, because he's also a photographer. So everybody, welcome our uh, last speaker for this session before we go into Q&A. And please remember to leave your comments in, uh, yeah, in the chat. Today, we're going to be talking about rapid prototyping, which some folks define as the creation of a model that will eventually be discarded rather than becoming part of the final delivered software. But as many of you who have worked in software probably know, things that we think shouldn't end up in production very often end up in production. So I think it makes more sense to define it as taking an idea and getting it to an MVP as efficiently, economically, and effectively as possible. So to me, rapid prototyping isn't something that you're just going to throw away completely. It's something you're hoping to refactor and polish and maybe use again. And today we're specifically gonna be talking about rapid prototyping AI applications while using some AI tools and specifically some tools that you can run locally for free. Even on a MacBook Pro from 2012 that is stuck on Mac OS 10.15. And apologies in advance for the low quality of some of these demo clips, this poor little laptop was just burning up trying to run some of this stuff and also record the screen at the same time. Hey there, my name is Eric. I'm a developer advocate at Datadog, and I've been having a lot of fun in the AI space lately. That's the AI version of Bits, our logo, by the way. I love my doggo, Judge, and my fiance, Priyanka. We love to travel, and I love to cook. And I also love board games and tabletop role-playing games like Dungeons and Dragons. So I thought it'd be fun to prototype an AI app aimed at helping dungeon masters refer to rules, sling some dice, quickly describe events and name places, people, things, and whatever else you might need to end up naming while running a campaign. And we're gonna run through a few layers of the stack here and discuss things you can run locally for free to prototype similar applications. Beyond a basic chat UI, we'll also have a serverless function that accepts our prompts and can stream back responses to that UI. And we'll have a locally running vector database that we can use to augment our bot with information from the real world. In this case, we'll be looking things up in the 5th edition Systems Reference Document, or SRD for short, uh, which is sort of like the open source core rules for D&D 5th edition. And then we'll also have a quantized large language model running locally and responding to our prompts using a retrieval augmented generation, or RAG, strategy powered by that vector database. And because I want to make sure that you know that anyone can do this, I'm going to be avoiding the most popular language for AI applications, Python, and doing the whole thing in TypeScript. The JavaScript ecosystem is definitely lagged behind Python in terms of the AI space, but it's still incredibly easy to spin up an AI application locally and validate your ideas. A couple of quick disclaimers so nobody gets too mad at me while you watch this. I am not an AI expert. I'm just a dude with a lot of curiosity, probably too much time, and I like to play around with stuff. I will be simplifying things. I don't think a deep understanding is necessary for what we're talking about today, so I've simplified some stuff to make it easier to talk about and hopefully more enjoyable to listen to. I might anthropomorphize. I know logically that these language models are just programs doing what programs do, but sometimes what they can do is pretty interesting. And the last one, I had to speed up some of these recordings because a machine this old can be really slow to generate some of this output. And I've got a very limited amount of time to talk to you today, so I can't wait for it to actually take the full amount of time. Uh, if you were running the same stack on a modern MacBook Pro, it will be impressively fast, I promise you. Now that that's all out of the way, let's get into the fun stuff and take a look at some of the tools that we're gonna use today to quickly scaffold, iterate, and develop our prototypes. The first tool we're gonna to talk about is Olama, which is a really, really cool service that lets you install, modify, and run large language models on your local machine. And you define them in a syntax kind of like this, which looks a lot like a Docker file. And that allows you to modify and create your own version of a model with its own system prompt. And then you can chat with it all on your local machine without sending out anything to any third-party servers. That brings us to the first rapid prototyping tip that I have for you. Actually, that's a mouthful, so let's just call them prototips. There are so many models out there, like seriously a staggering amount of them, and not every model is suited to every task. You might find the general purpose model gives you a good enough idea for your prototype, but if you're focused on something like code generation, you might want to explore the code-specific models. 
These local models, especially the heavily quantized ones, might need some serious tweaking to the system prompt and settings like temperature, which dictates how creative the model is, to get them to respond correctly. You will need to play around with this. And here's a tip if you're on low-powered hardware, which I guess I'm going to call a low tip. The 7 billion parameter V3 of Orca Mini, which is based on Llama 2, works surprisingly well on low-powered devices. Everything you've seen on my 2012 MacBook Pro there has been powered by Orca Mini 7B V3. Two other tools we'll make use of here are the Versal AI SDK and LangChain. Versal's AI SDK is going to help us have a nice streaming UI for our chat interface. Uh, integrates really well with React, Next.js, things like that. And then LangChain is going to help us with actually retrieving information from our vector database. And in our case, that vector database is going to be Chroma, which is an open source vector database that you can run in a Docker container locally. And let's quickly just talk about how a vector database works and how this sort of retrieval augmented setup we're going to use works in practice. We'll start with our document, which is Markdown. And this one is a representation of the Goblin stat block. And that document gets broken down into manageable chunks that we're able to convert into vectors and then store in our database. And they look something like this. And those get broken into tokens like this. And tokens get converted into IDs, which is how the model internally understands what different words are. And you end up with a big array of a bunch of those chunks broken down into tokens. And then each of those tokens gets broken down into vectors. And that is what we're going to end up storing in our database along with the document content and some metadata about where this information came from. So when your user comes by to ask a question, like how many hit points do goblins have, that gets broken into tokens, which get turned into their IDs and then vectorized. Then your database query compares those to the vectors already stored in the database and returns any documents that have the right amount of overlap based on different algorithms that are way outside the realm of my understanding. And then you can take the content from those and inject them into your system prompt, and that's retrieval augmented generation in a nutshell. That brings us to our next proto tip. You don't need to load up every possible document and generate embeddings for it. Just pipe in a few and test against those for a general idea of how things will work. You'll probably want to work on some more advanced and logical chunking strategies for production anyway, and you'll just waste a bunch of time generating embeddings that you're probably going to throw away. Which also gives us another low tip. Just load in one or two very short documents if you're on low-powered stuff. It can take a really long time to generate embeddings on low-powered hardware. And also, super low tip, don't try to run your vector DB's Docker container to insert the embeddings directly after you generate them. Just write them out to disk and do that part later, because if both of those are running at the same time, your computer will have a very bad day. Now, you might have seen bots that can do all sorts of fun stuff, like make API requests. And that's generally considered a function in the OpenAI world, or plugin if you're using ChatGPT's UI, or a tool if you're in the LangChain ecosystem. And if you're running a pretty large, capable model, that's definitely how you should approach it. But if you're rapid prototyping on old hardware, like this, you should just fake it. Wire up some magic command that tells your chat endpoint to execute your function, and then you can hook that up to a real tool or function or whatever the system you're in happens to be calling it at the time, your more advanced model can actually call later. And that's what I did with the dice rolling mechanic here. Here's another proto tip. If you have a tiny local model or one that just doesn't seem to want to handle function calling, like one of the OpenAI models, just sidestep the issue and hack in your own handling of it with some magic string prefix. In my experience, defining function calls and tools, you'll need to spend a good bit of time refining your prompt and function description just to make sure the model even uses them correctly. And if this thing is worth pursuing, you can just wire up the same function that your magic string invokes to the model's function calling when it's time to move beyond your local environment. Thank you so much, Eric. So this, again, I just look at the sea of the comments and I'm very excited to uh, join get all of you guys to get to know Eric and Rory, of course. I have a feeling this is going to be a really high energy Q&A session. So hi, guys, how are you? Hello, yes, live, uh, Goda. I'm, I'm, I'm very, very excited to be live. I actually did that entire session that you saw there with me um, in one take. Yeah, so crazy. I, I definitely way, way prefer Way prefer being live and engaging with the audience. So yeah, really keen to get some questions from you. Absolutely. And Eric, again, also, thank you so much for a session. 
Rory, maybe you should start a YouTube channel. If you can pull that off with a one take session, I can promise you that you will have amazing career on YouTube. I have. I have about 10 YouTube channels. I work for Microsoft oh as a principal uh, cloud advocate. And as a result, we have 50 million developers that call Microsoft home. So definitely, <laughs> if you want to go to the VS Code or the Azure, you can just uh, search for me. Um, and then you'll see some of the, the material there. I also do cloud material, um, so Azure Cloud, and also programming. I'm a Java developer for 20 years now. Um, and Semantic Kernel was just absolutely fascinating because it, it feels like a relational database, but it's a little bit more. It's like a relational database you can talk to, and, and, and I love that experience. Okay, fantastic. So let's then jump right into the specific questions, okay? So Rory, this one goes to you. So can we use Autogen using Semantic Kernel? I would love to know what Autogen is, though. I'm okay. not too sure what Autogen is, though, so I can't actually state. Maybe we can ask someone to explain it, mm -hmm. or maybe I can just quickly search for it. So and, while you and... search, then I would say ask Learn with Girish to elaborate on this question a little bit more. And then, okay, fixing the situation. Um, hi, Rory. This is, comes from Keith. I've been using prompt engineering for the last eight months to build applications. I'm finding it challenging to present my new skills to employers. What are good avenues to do that? Especially, okay, so I think you coming from Microsoft, this is kind of, I guess, targeted question. It's definitely something that um, I, I have the perfect answer for. So so let me just go back to the Autogen uh, question. Oh, I haven't found. used it, but it, it is an orchestrator. It is from Microsoft as an orchestrator, but I haven't used it, though. So I, I'm not going to comment on, on, on that, though. The second question was, how do you get started to create a portfolio? We have a portal called Awesome AZD with 70 plus templates. And we've got a, a lot of our partners, we've got VMware and uh, a, a lot of our other partners creating templates there that you can go in there. You can go to um, Awesome AZD. And the template that I demoed in my session was actually a Awesome AZD template. So if you want to create a template, you need to have a, a valid ecosystem. And then you can go in and then you can get uh, assistance. It's like also saying, how do you know if a developer is uh, equipped? How many stars do they have? What is their GitHub contribution? So definitely go into Awesome AZD, start contributing, uh, ping me, let me pl uh, play with your template, and then hopefully I can amplify it. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so... The question, I want to go back to the question about, you know, the career. Um, let me just find, do you, uh, do you remember the, the question I just popped? I'm sorry, this is, I'm just going through a sea you of questions. You asked how you get started. Yeah, um, yeah what is so, the avenue to do that? Well, you, you need to understand also that a developer is based on two, two main uh, channels or uh, uh, pillars. One, you have the self, and that's education, relevance, and experience. And the other, you have the social or the, the human experience, and that's uh, mentorship and also uh, community. So um, I, I use Microsoft as the arm in my, um, in, on my pillars, but you need to have education. So that would be your formal education, your degree, or your, your high school, then your experience, so that would be, oh, wow, I can see what's coming up, and then you can, you can kind of predict it, but then relevance. So it's important to understand relevance and to understand that this is a domain that none of us actually understand. Uh, this is so new that you have to go and say, okay, I want to be relevant. I want to start documenting and uh, reading up on that, though, and, and then have joy. If you can find and you can tap into the joy of this uh, generative AI, I guarantee you, you're going to find a way to create a career in it. Fantastic. Thank you so much for this, you know, inspiring answer. Um, okay, so Eric, very specific question. What, what you showed, is this supported only with OpenAI? Uh, no, so all that was running locally on my machine. Uh, there was no server calls at all. It was all happening on the MacBook Pro with local LLM, local Chroma database, local everything. Fantastic. 
Okay, and question to both of you, which comes from Keith Newton. And Keith has also like elaborate long questions, so we will see if we get to that. But this one is very specific. So hi, Eric and Rory. Hi, Keith. What is the work you both have done in digital accessibility? That's a good question. So I, I have achondroplasia, uh, dwarfism. And one of the things that we've been doing is looking at, I'm an accessibility advocate for Microsoft, is can OpenAI help with accessibility? The WCAG um, standard, it's detailed, it's, uh, it's, um, it's mature. So what we did is we, we created two channels to look at accessibility. One is to solve the accessibility issues before um, they, they get created. And to do that, we've created a coaching application in beta that is going to go and help it. Exactly what I showed you with Semantic Kernel, it consumes information and does it. Two, and I'll, I'll, put, uh, I'll put the um, URL there, we have an application that can go in and uh, it uses um, some uh, OpenAI uh, prompts to go in and fix the accessibility issues. So what wow. it does, it will scan your HTTP uh, files, React or uh, plain H uh, HTML, and then it will go in there and say, wow, OK, we found an issue. It uses the X linter, so which is the de facto standard using X rules. And, and then it goes in and says, I found an issue. Now, OpenAI, can you go and fix the issue? And we, <laughs> we scan tens of thousands of websites internally to actually go in there. And the, the novelty is that you can do it on a PR. So as the PR hits, you go in there and you say, wow, whoa, I, can, I, I have an issue there but I'll solve it for you. You still need the human being to actually go in and, and uh, for our principle it though. But we are uh, really, really excited around the, the ability to, to give people the opportunity to fix their issues automatically. Caveat, accessibility is complicated and it does still need humans. Thank you. Eric, do you have anything to add to this uh, um, question? Just, in terms of like my experience with accessibility, I spent most of my career up to this point as a software developer working mostly in the front end. And I've worked with a lot of banks and financial institutions and designed so many little drop down widgets and form inputs of all sorts of weird types that you need for banking stuff uh, to be accessible. And I think trying to figure out how to integrate some of the new tooling that we have with generative AI with some of the older approaches to accessibility will be super interesting. I haven't had a chance to really explore it yet, but I would love to see what happens if you can start hooking up like, uh, you know, generative AI to some text to speech stuff that actually sounds pretty good and maybe piping that into a screen reader to like, I think there's so much stuff we could try to do that would be really cool. Yeah, the sky's the limit. And what we like to say on our podcast is that AI is the worst it will ever be. And from this point, it's just going to be more accessible, more fascinating. Okay, so now it's going to be like, I will try to do my best uh, to go to the questions. So we have Dar Darf Looper, and thank you Darf for being super engaged and posting so many questions. And also talking with community, love seeing your contributions. So, okay, so how do we approach keeping creativity and freedom in AI while protecting against abuse and breaching? Rory, do you want to jump into this one? Uh, yeah, we have at Microsoft. If... Oh, I guess we lost Rory. <laughs> I think if this is like one wrong click away and Rory is gone. So we will wait for Rory to join. Ellen, Eric, um, do we still have you here? Yeah, I think so. Okay, so um, do you want to uh, jump into this question maybe? Um, I mean, I can, I can try. I'm no expert in that part of the field yet, uh, mm -hmm. but I think there's some really interesting tools that are coming out now to sort of try to address some of that. Uh, there's a really cool one from a company called Lacara. It's called Lacara Guard. And it actually, like, you feed the prompt and the messages coming in into that program first. And it basically, I think, uses several different uh, LLMs to analyze what's in there and see, like, hey, this has a prompt injection in it, or hey, this is exposing PII or things like that. Um, it's super cool. If you saw the Gandalf game that came out a while back that was super popular about prompt injection, it's the company that built that. It's their, like, underlying tool. It's pretty cool. Fantastic. And Rory, so I guess one cl wrong click and we were gone. Um, you were just about to yes. share with us. 
this is what happens when you do StreamYard because your browser <laughs> is dependent on that. But so at Microsoft, we have a responsible AI portal and we have a, a checklist you can do. And we also have tools that can go in there and analyze your model according to our responsible AI principles. We have responsible AI now on 1.6 billion people's PCs. So uh, on my PC here, I have the uh, Windows Copilot, which was built with responsible AI. And that was rolled out along with the M365, the Microsoft Dynamics, uh, the uh, Bing Chat uh, um, uh, responsible AI. And all of those use the same principles, but you can get the same tool set to go and check your, um, your LLM model though, that we are right now rolling out to 1.6 billion people. So it's, it's a little bit of bragging rights though, but you know, if we're gonna do that, then it has to be responsible. So yeah, so definitely go check our responsible AI portal though, our tool sets and our also checklists. Thank you so much for sharing. So I dropped in the chat and I'm just going to, you You shared quickly with me the accessibility repo. So anybody please um, click the link in the chat. Thank you, Rory, for that. Um, okay, so we have five more minutes and I have this question uh, from Darth Looper. So uh, about Metaprompts. As someone who is very minded towards security and transparency, how do you see engines based on pre-compiled prompts, meta prompts, having a place in the everyday life of consumers? Um, whoever wants to uh, uh, start, Eric, do you have any point of view on this one? Um, yeah, I guess I could I could talk a little, pontificate a little about it. Uh, so I think one of the things you have to think about if we're going to be dealing with like taking input and injecting that into some sort of prompt that we're then going to be piping into some other system is the same thing we've always had to worry about with any user input is like, you can't trust user input, you have to. And then I guess now we also can't trust whatever comes back from the LLM. So you have like two layers of distrust you have to deal with now. And I think there's probably a, a whole industry or ecosystem to be built around like sanitizing and, uh, you know, making the input and output from these things safe. And right now I think it's kind of the wild west. So right now it's just sort of like you cross your fingers and <laughs> hope that nothing breaks and try to, you know, sandbox things where you can. But I think as we develop more, we'll start to find some tooling that gets developed to help handle some of this stuff. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and I have another question for you. So again, accessibility in AI is key interest. And the comment goes like, I've been, uh, I built two apps this year for accessibility using AI. How do you see accessibility being addressed using AI? It's a broad question and we kind of like touched on that, but Eric, any pointers, any specific use cases? Um, I haven't actually, so I've been more exploring the like, can I make fun little apps like a dm app with ai recently and i have not gotten to the can i make something that's actually like uh you know super helpful to someone in their everyday life uh this might be helpful to a dm every once in a while but not like you know something that's super important and i feel like accessibility is something that requires a lot of intention and a lot of like really thinking about what you're trying to achieve and why you're trying to achieve it and actually going and talking with someone who you you hope to benefit with that tool and actually like get to their perspective and work with them closely with like user-oriented design around like, how are we gonna build this thing? So me just hacking on it in my spare time might produce something kind of interesting, but probably not anything that useful, so. Thank you so much. Um, I think it was like uh, Keith, I'm just looking for a comment. Keith shared that he has built also like apps for his, uh, I think daughter, like our child to actually prompt bedtime stories. Another exciting use case. Um, Okay, so uh, let's just, um, one second, I have a question about orchestrator, which I think everyone kind of was like, whoa. Um, so are orchestrator agents ever confused or dispatch the wrong agent to complete a task? If so, what steps can we take to ensure it is picked the right agent? How do you find out why it went wrong? Okay, I'll go first. Um, yes. <laughs> what you're talking about is telemetry and testing. So one of the patterns is to get another AI 
to test that. Because what you want to do is you, you want to have uh, the, 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 the common rag pattern or go orientated programming to, to have your meta prompt to get the customer or your client to ask that meta prompt and then going through the, the process of the steps though. But it's a workflow. So you can actually go and check that workflow. And what, one of the, the industry moves is to have some degree of self-check on that. You can actually ask the AI, please self-check yourself, or you can use another model for that though. The difficulty comes in that the, the planner, for example, in Semantic Kernel, and as it progresses there, you're gonna get tens of thousands of prompts of agents that you're gonna be able to uh, address there. And as the industry moves out there, we're gonna find out that we're gonna have one small little AR speaking to another big AR, speaking to another big AR, and speaking to another big AR. That's exactly what Semantic Kernel does. It's a smaller AR speaking to another big AI though. And GPT-3, well now GPT-4 also, is exactly that. So when we built it, we, we actually had access to the architecture, the underlying architect. GPT-4 is a little bit more um, kind of hidden, but it's the, the, the completion model surrounded by a chat model, Instruct GPT. So already from the beginning with GPT-3, we had two models speaking to each other. Now with GPT-4, we, we've got probably a little bit more around that though. The same principle goes with a orchestrator. You need the ability for one model to govern and sidecar to another. Eric, what do you think? Yeah, no, I think that is uh, spot on. I don't think I could add much to, to that one. Okay, thank you so much. Um, you know, a lot of questions are coming specifically for use cases. So uh, as for example, project manager, are there any tools inside these large language models that would help with managing a project? Any tools that you have off the top yeah, of your head? Yeah, we built one it's called M365 <laughs> Copilot though. It literally, yes. it, I've got it on Excel, I've got it on project, I've got it on PowerPoint. I don't want to tell you a secret, but you know that PowerPoint that I sent you? It kind of was built with an LNM. <laughs> you just revealed this. You go, fantastic. Thank you I, so I much. I go in there and I say, okay, cool. This is what I want to talk about. Go create the slide deck. It will go and create the slide deck and then use I, I use Dolly 3, some of those pictures, and it go, goes in and creates it, though. I am spoiled for choice because I've got um, early access for that, though. But we, I have more than 10 of those robots floating around my PC now. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, okay, so I have a question for Eric. What are some key considerations for selecting an open source model when you are in the prototyping phase, especially in the context of AI? And this is very much also I would combine with a question from, um, I can't pronounce this username, I'm very sorry. Um, yeah, what are trade-offs between large language models like GPT versus smaller large language models? For instance, I could use multiple small large language models or open source for each specific task, but there is large variability in token requests. So this is a lot, uh, Eric, um, yeah. any pointers here? So when you're trying to pick a model, uh, to run locally, I think the first important thing to figure out is like how powerful is your machine? And uh, if the answer is not very powerful, that's okay. It just means you're gonna have to like start looking at simpler models and models that have been quantized more and models that are, you know, uh, fine-tuned a little bit more effectively, a little differently. Uh, the one that I shared earlier, the Orca Mini one, like I said, can run on a 2012 MacBook Pro pretty well. It's not the fastest because it's an old machine that just doesn't have a lot of resources to work with, but it works. Um, and then there are, you know, Mistral is pretty nice general purpose one that just came out recently. And then someone actually has released an Orca version of Mistral that's pretty cool. Uh, it can do a lot of stuff. It's really powerful. And then in terms of the difference between using like GPT-4 and these other LMs, like real talk, GPT-4 is just super powerful for all general purpose stuff you needed to do. And it's like really good at every task pretty much you can think of. So it's going to be really, really good. And then the other stuff, you can make different models be really good at different things, but it's not going to be like just out of the box. You're like, oh, this is great and it works perfectly because it just it doesn't work that way. Um, it would be nice if it did, but we're not there yet. We will eventually probably get there, but right now you won't. Uh, in terms of using multiple models and stringing them together, it's super cool. Uh, there's this one called Nexus Raven, which is just totally fine-tuned on function calling. Like the only purpose it has is like 
you give it a list of these functions and it's when it hears something, it says, oh, I need to call this function. So some people have been working on orchestrating a bunch of other LLMs using Nexus Raven as sort of a like a you know a puppeteer that it gets the request and it decides like oh it should go to this and then it calls out to another LLM does the stuff uh, to do that locally you're going to have to be running multiple language models locally which means you're going to need a really powerful machine or multiple machines that you can then send requests across your network which can also happen um, you can deploy stuff to places and do that too but. I, I don't know the cost of once it gets off your machine, to be honest. I've only been playing locally or with uh, the GPT-4 API. So, But I think there's definitely a lot to explore there. And if you have the resources to run them and orchestrate them together locally, I would, I would say go for it because it's super cool. Um, <laughs> there's uh, this one tool called Open Interpreter that you also might want to look yes. into that uh, generates code for you in your terminal or in a Jupyter Notebook or in uh, just Python if you want to use it. And it's super cool. Uh, we're also working on adding some some other sandboxing to it, like allowing it to spin up a Docker container every time it wants to run code. So you actually are like, you know, insulated from what it's going to be doing because obviously letting LLM just run code on your machine is kind of like scary. I'm sure that there's some people that like cringe as soon as I said that, but it's pretty cool. Um, and that's another fun one to play with. And you can actually get it to talk to other LLMs as well and start to sort of orchestrate things that way. And people are making some really cool stuff with it. And uh, I'm laughing because you mentioned Open Interpreter. I recently made a video about Open Interpreter. And one of the use cases, you know, like I'm not a programmer, but like I'm learning on steroids right now. Uh, I used it to organize my computer files. <laughs> but then I maybe realized that maybe GPT-4 is a little bit too expensive for this type of use case. But definitely, um, I think people should check it out. And there are some concerns, you know, at the corporate level. Uh, but also incredible use cases. Okay, I have two very loaded questions, so I'm very curious. Um, and people want, you know, multiple people are wait, voting for this question. Rory, any secrets or tips you can share about OpenAI API that aren't well known? Do you know anything about the Vision API? <laughs> yeah, so, you can also ditch this. I just had to pop it up because people are rooting for this question. So the Vision API, we actually, it, we, we called it Project Florence. And Project Florence, we used initially for accessibility. We used it to go in alt image. So when you go into Microsoft Word or PowerPoint and you go, please generate an image, we're using the Vision API uh, behind it there. And we took that learning behind that and we helped build the the Dolly engines because you know Dolly needs to understand the, um, with the multimodal um, transformer it needs to understand what's going on there. So we helped train that. But now when you go to Dolly three, you can also go forward engineer from Dolly three and then back engineer for, uh, from ChatGPT. You can read and um, create and generate the, those images though. So I think the the biggest secret is if you use Microsoft Word right now, you're using the Vision API right now to, to go in and get those uh, alt images, though. Um, it goes a little bit further because the, the images now and the, the models can kind of read text and write text. This is only like a week old, and that's GPT-4B. Uh, it can read and write text. I'm, I'm, I sat with my, my son, 13-year-old uh, today, and, and my daughter, 6-year-old, and I created a comic book, but with the text in the image with that. And then I read it back to them. I showed them and they, they went, I, 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 the world opened up to them because they, they understood that vision now could read. Yeah. This is like the moment you kind of get this like a click moment. That's it. There is no way wow. back. When you join this type of conferences and you just go to deep, deep rabbit hole. Um, yeah. Thank you for sharing this. I will sneak in one more question, but someone I, also sorry, commented. Sorry? Can I add one little pro yeah, tip sure, that some people sure, might I'm not sorry. know about with the OpenAI API? So um, if you have found that you're having trouble getting some of your system prompt instructions to be followed appropriately once you get like pretty far into the conversation, you've got a lot of messages flying around, it can actually help sometimes if you take it from being the first message in the array and pop it at the end and make it the very last thing that pops up. Uh, that can actually sometimes have this weird impact that makes the model like think about it more and use it. Uh, the other option is also to just, at a certain point, switch from system to user prompt on that, because right now user prompts are still like weighted a little more heavily, and then you can just sort of like force it to do what you were trying to get it to do. So 
And I've learned that after experimenting a whole lot, building a uh, music recommendation service that basically just runs your Spotify and keeps queuing up songs for you uh, with the OpenAI API. So. Uh, this is so fun that you mentioned this. So both with Rory and yourself, uh, talking about meta prompting, I, I just have to sneak this one here. Um, I published two videos about Professor Synapse, and I don't know if you heard of it. This is really copy paste meta prompt to, into ChatGPT. You can add it to custom instructions. Full credit to Joseph Rosenbaum. He's part of our team. But in this prompt, there is a commands. And there's one command like slash safe. And if you do that, it also goes and summarizes and pulls what was the beginning, the middle, summarizes, and it's really extending. And we are working now on, you know, vectorizing the whole memory as well. So exciting stuff. I, I'm actually very curious for both of you to check it out. This prompt kind of exploded. Um, sorry, uh, break uh, alarm. But uh, it's more than 100,000 people using that, and we've been receiving incredible. So I think meta prompting is really the way to go as well as orchestrators. OK, so coffee break. Um, there is way more questions. So I think Rory, uh, Eric, if you can stay and engage in the chat, that would be fantastic. Thank you for all the links. If there is anything you want to share with the audience, drop it to me, and I will distribute that. Um, but thank you for your energy and everything what you guys do. This is incredible. Yeah, thanks for listening to us. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thank you. And cheers, everyone. <laughs> to tell. Okay, so we are going to go now for our coffee break. And it doesn't need to be coffee. If it is like orange juice, it's perfectly fine. Um, but yeah, I see you all in around 10 minutes. <laughs>
Welcome back, everybody. I saw some comments with people moving on to beer. Uh, for any people in Germany, this is Club Mate, alternative to your energy drink. So yes, not exactly healthy, but we need this to move forward because believe me, this is track one. Track two is equally mind-blowing as well. So we are going to continue and our next speaker is Greg Nash. And please, everybody, meet Greg. He's a founder and principal consultant of Dear Watson Consulting and holds a two-time Microsoft Most Valuable Professional Award. A leader in Melbourne's Power Platform and Power BI user group, Greg is not just an expert. He's a passionate advocate for all things Power BI and Power Platform. With vast experience across diverse industries, he's a renowned trainer, speaker, and content creator. Hello, fellow content creator. Get ready to be inspired and say hi to Greg. And this is going to be just another incredible presentation. G'day folks, you're here for another session at the Prompt Engineering Summit. We're going to be talking about building complex data visualizations with chat GPT. So on to the presentation. Uh, as I said, uh, my name's Greg Nash. I'm a principal consultant at Deal Watson Consulting. Uh, I'm a certified Azure solution architect. I'm a Microsoft MVP in the data platform. And uh, I work for Deal Watson Consulting, who's a Microsoft solution partner in the data and AI space. You can find me on LinkedIn and I run the local Power BI Melbourne meetup uh, here in Melbourne, Australia, if you're interested in Power BI, uh, worth checking out. So as we sort of embark on this discussion around the kind of intricate process of building complex visualizations using Vega Lite and ChatGPT, I wanted to kickstart our thought process with some insightful words. So first we start off with Thomas Edison, who was obviously an inventor who reminds us that what may initially appear as failure is in reality a stepping stone towards discovery. And each attempt or each iteration brings us closer to what doesn't work and guide us, guides us towards what does. In the spirit of perseverance, Winston Churchill uh, beautifully encapsulates the challenges associated with uh, with uh, technology and especially sort of large language models, I think, where the journey towards success is continual. It's not a destination, but an ongoing journey of refinement and learning. Uh, when we encounter hurdles, they're not endpoints, but they nudge us in the right direction. And then in the third quote for today, I've got John C. Maxwell, who urges us to embrace failure as component of progress. The component, concept of failure, failing forward is central to iterative development. And I can tell you that I certainly live my life in this way. I uh, am happy to try and fail as many things as possible. I think that's how you need to be in this space in technology. And if you're working in uh, the AI space or the generative, uh, generative AI space or large language models, or you're just trying to learn a little bit more about prompt engineering, be prepared to embrace failure. I think that's particularly important. You need to have a positive mindset. Now in the landscape that I work in, in data science and AI, where the ability to visually represent complex data, set, data sets is basically what we do. And we're doing things that are potentially outside the realms of what the standard data visualization tools will allow us to do, or at least we're trying to do potentially some more complex stuff. In today's discussion, I'm hoping to equip you, an aspiring prompt engineer with, a, with some knowledge and some strategies to navigate maybe some more intricate processes as we delve into the principles of using iterative development uh, in large language models and explore how building robust and complex solutions using ChatGPT and maybe eliminate the pathway to becoming a more proficient uh, prompt engineer. Uh, to start out with though, I need to give you a bit of a conceptual foundation. So let's crack on and we'll see how we go in terms of uh, getting some of these things uh, 
across to you. So of course, the tools we're going to be using today, uh, the first one, ChatGPT. I presume you're relatively familiar with this. If you're in this space, you're looking to improve your either your ChatGPT skills or your generative AI prompt engineering skills in general. Uh, obviously, it's a large language model. Uh, it's very good at natural language processing and all those good things. The second tool that we'll be using is a language is called Vega Light. Vega Light is a high level grammar for visually interactive graphics. That means it's a language that we use to describe different uh, graphics. And it's used across all sorts of different tools in all sorts of different areas. You'll see a lot of the web visualizations, data visualizations that you've come across in the past. They will have been built in Vega or Vega Light. Uh, in this case, we'll be using a Microsoft tool. That Microsoft tool is called Power BI. It is the ubiquitous Microsoft data visualization tool. Uh, you can think of it as Excel with some steroids attached. It's really uh, like a really high level data visualization tool from Power BI. And inside the Power BI tool, we'll be using a, 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 a special visualization called Deneb, which allows us to use Vega Light Grammar to describe our data visualizations. So Deneb is our visualization uh, framework that allows us to define our Vega Light specification. So on the left hand side here, you can see you've got some Vega Light specs. Uh, that is basically just JSON. Uh, we describe what we want to show on the screen in JSON in what in this specification on the right hand side the visualization gets rendered into Power BI. Uh, and then on the bottom uh, there, you can see there's a little table of the data that we've got in our data set that's supplied to the visualization. So we've got this language that allows us to describe visualizations. And uh, lucky for us, we've also got a tool called ChatGPT that is extremely good at language. Uh, fortunately for me, uh, ChatGPT already knows about Vega Lite and it already knows about Vega because they've been around for long enough for ChatGPT to understand it. And really when it comes to prompting and how we were going to approach this, uh, there's obviously a lot of different ways that you can prompt, you know, these, uh, these text-based language models, right? You can do sort of text-based text completion style prompts. So you can say the quick brown fox and it'll tell you to jumped over the lazy dog, that kind of thing. Uh, you can give it instruction based prompts. So like these single prompts or multiple choice prompts. So you see end shot or few shot prompting, right? Where you've got uh, a few examples of what you want in terms of the desired output. Uh, you've got chain of thought prompting and generated knowledge prompting. You've got these different prompting techniques and that you can potentially use to prompt uh, your language model. The interesting thing, and based on the experimentation that I've done so far, and I've been trying to break it as much as possible, I guess, is that uh, when you're faced with something that's more complex than just uh, some, something relatively straightforward, you need to have a prompting strategy that allows you to do that. So what do you do if it's too complex for a simple single prompt? And the example I've got here is a data visualization that we are trying to build, right? So I, uh, this is a data visualization. It's from a, uh, from a book, one of my favorite books on data visualization. It's been lifted from the New York times, I believe to show New York city's weather in 2003. And you can see it's a fairly complex kind of bar chart type thing. You've got each bar represents the temperature, the min and the max temperature on any given day. So you've got your actual high and your actual low is represented by that sort of dark purpley color. Then the, the lighter kind of uh, gray bars in the background, they are your all time min and all time maximum temperatures. And then there's a darker bar that runs through the middle and that's your normal range. So that's a one standard deviation up or above or your, or your, uh, your average temperatures throughout that for that time of year, if you like. Then down the bottom, you've also got this cumulative rainfall. So you've got two charts here sort of stacked on top of each other. Uh, you can see there's some um, different numbers and things like that. It's, uh, it's broken up by months. Uh, it goes from minus 20 to 110 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and it's great visualization. This is, this is the type of data visualization we'd want to build in the world of data visualization. It's really, really strong 
in terms of its data density. It tells a really great story because you can see the, um, the, the, the macro story of how the temperature rises and falls throughout the year. And then you can see the micro story of each day and whether the day was somewhere near the all time high or was it uh, low for, or, you know, lower than average for that day. And so there's a, there's a lot of different sort of uh, pieces of information you can glean from a single visualization that makes it a really strong data visualization. When you're faced with this type of visualization though, like I couldn't write a single ChatGPT prompt or, a, or prompt in anything really that would allow me to build this in a single go, right? It's too complicated. I, I'd have to, I'd have to really think about it and get right. And even when we, uh, you know, when we completed this process and we asked ChatGPT to generate a prompt, it generated most of it, but it didn't quite get there, right? So what do you do when you're faced with a, a situation where you're trying to build something that's too complex for a single prompt? And I think most things fall into this category, in my opinion. There's not too many things. And I think a lot of prompt engineering is, is, is focused on how do we craft the perfect prompt? And we have to craft a perfect system prompt. We have to craft this one perfect prompt that's going to get this perfect output each time. I think that's the wrong way to think about prompting. I think the right way to think about prompting is to say that, well, you can use multiple prompts to get to your outcome, right? And that's, I think, you know, most people, you know, it's common sense. You kind of use multiple prompts to get to, to the place where you want to be. So I was faced with this and a, and a friend of mine said, I'll bet you a beer you can't get ChatGPT to build this. And I took that as a challenge. <laughs> so this is what I know. A lot of bad prompts is better than one perfect prompt. And I think we need to embrace a concept of iterative development to be able to achieve this. Now let's talk a little bit about iterative development because this is not a new concept. Uh, there's a really great quote from John Gall uh, from a book called The Systems Bible. It's a it's a story. It's a not a story. It's a it's a book about systems, and really it talks about how systems are constantly trying to fail on you, right? There's all these things trying to make things fail, and one of the things that John Gall found was that a complex system that works is invariably found to have evolved from a simple system that worked. So. This is at the heart of our kind of iterative development idea, right? Is that we need to build something very simple that works. If, if we want to build something complicated, start with something simple. The inverse pro proposition is also true. That means if you try to design something complex from scratch, if you try to write a perfect prompt from scratch, it won't work and you can't make it work because there's too much complexity in your end result, right? And so... I think you need to move away from this idea of trying to craft these singular uh, perfect prompts and move towards this kind of agile development uh, process. Uh, iterative development's been around for a long time. You've heard me just say the word agile. Agile is an iterative development uh, process for software development, right? We, we talk about iterative development in almost everything. There's this funny old kind of relationship between agility or agile or iterative development and originality, right? That I, you know, I think about this a lot where if you're trying to build something extremely original, you need to be more iterative, right? And typically a lot of the stuff that we're building using these, these uh, large language models and using prompt engineering is a completely new and original thing. It's not necessarily something that's been defined before because we're not really going to be using a prompt, uh, a, a large language model for that. So let's, let me, let me kind of ram home this, uh, this idea to you, right? So if you're building a house, it's a pretty unoriginal thing to build thousands and thousands of millions and millions probably of houses get built every year. Right. And so the way to build a house is relatively well-defined. It's not a particularly original thing to do. That means you can use a pretty kind of unagile un way of developing. We call this waterfall type development where you just say, okay, I'm going to do step A and step B and step C and step D. And then we're going to have a house at the end of it. 
you wouldn't use a really uh, agile way of building a house. An agile way to build a house would be say, let's build a wall over here. Oh, I don't really like the wall there. Let's take the wall down and we'll put it up over here. Oh, now I like the wall here. Let's build the second wall and let's build the third wall. It doesn't really make sense to build a house that way, right? And so for these low originality, well-defined kind of activities, you don't necessarily need an iterative kind of approach. If you're a comedian and you are trying to build a comedy set, and for those of you who are familiar with the likes of, say, Bill Burr and these other comedians, they go on these long tours of uh, of various uh, of various venues to work on their comedy set, right? And they do hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of iterations of the set before they take it to do their Netflix special or whatever it is. So you've got these comedians, they take a very agile uh, approach to things because they need to basically come up something, with something completely original. It's incredibly difficult because it's really hard to make people laugh on it at any given time. And so you need to go through these hundreds of iterations in order to get to a point where you've got an hour's worth of comedy that's available to you to use for your set, right? So... So they're all almost on the opposite end of the spectrum when it comes to this kind of originality and, and agility kind of curve. Now, if you are in the, if you have an unoriginal thing, so you say you want to try and build a house and then you try and build it in an agile way, like I said before, you build a wall and then move the wall and then move the wall again, you're kind of wasting money, right? So that's kind of in the waste of money zone if, you, if, you, if you're not original enough. Conversely, if you're highly original, uh, having a highly original thing that you're trying to build and you don't, you're not agile enough or you don't use an iterative development process, you end up in this never finish zone because the thing changes more quickly than the project can kind of catch up. And you see this happen with people when they try to do software development using waterfall methodology and changes are constantly happening and you just never get to the, uh, never get to the finish line. And so you end up in this never finished zone. So there's a bit of a fine balance between this originality and agility kind of uh, uh, kind of concept. So what we can learn from this is if we have a very clear goal, we, we're going to have fewer iterations, right? Well, we we're going to require fewer, fewer iterations. So I'm kind of lucky in this space that this data visualization is already well defined for me, right? I don't need to... Uh, think about how the thing's going to look. I can just copy what I'm doing here already. So just that's something to keep in mind when you're doing these types of things. The clearer you have in terms of design or a goal, the uh, the easier it's going to be and the less iterations you're potentially going to have to go through because you're going to have a much easier idea. Now, one of the things, particularly when you're interacting with something like ChatGPT or a large language model, is it's going to go off on tangents by itself, right? You have to be very clear about what you want to for the, the next piece, small piece of outcome to happen. I think this is why this is the best way to work with these models is because if you try to give it a very large piece of work, it's going to potentially go off in a few different directions. And if you try and do that over and over again, it's going to, there's too many possibilities for it to kind of drift away. And I've even just working on the, with the tool today, I was trying to get it to build some data visualizations and I was just giving it too much uh, too much to do in one go and it was trying one way and then it's trying a different way and it's trying a different way and I had to come down, pair it back to a simple single prompt that, um, that would work. And we'll talk a little bit about that more and I'll give you an example. So once we have our clear goal, then we want to make sure that all of the aspects of that goal are ready to go. We can call this kind of drafting kind of phase, right? So this is a standard visualization in Power BI. You can see it doesn't look anywhere near like what I want it to look like, but at least it works. The thing about this data visualization is that it's a simple line chart and I can see that my lines are in the right spot using this. You can see that I'm in, I'm in Australia, so this, it sweeps down instead of sweeping upwards like it does in America. So we sweep down through the middle of the year, it gets colder through the middle of the year and then hotter at the ends of the year. You can see that my high and my low, which are the light pink and the light blue lines are above my dark red and dark blue lines, which are my min and max for that individual day. So the, the, the data generally looks correct. 
which is what we want to ensure that we do before we embark on trying to build something using a large language model. We want to make sure that all of the inputs to this are going to be look good and, and are correct. The last thing you want to do is confuse two things, particularly in the world of data visualization, where there's a lot of things that can go wrong with the data. You can have data quality issues. You can have missing values. You can have all sorts of strange things can happen with the data. And so we want to make sure that our data is correct. This translates to pretty much everything that you're doing, anything that you're doing. If you're writing a, a movie script or whatever, you want to have a clear idea of kind of what you're doing going in and making sure all those inputs are there ready to go. Rather than trying to invent too much on the fly, the less you can do, the better anyway, because you're going to go down less rabbit holes. And so, like I said, we want to start simple and we want to make sure that we can build this thing iteratively and when i say start simple so in the world of data visualization if we look at this this visualization it's it's a version the top version of the top part of the visualization is essentially a bar chart it's not the same as a regular it's actually a, what we call a column chart in the power bi world where a bar chart runs horizontally and a column chart runs vertically so a column chart these though each one of those kind of uh, uh days is actually a column that goes from high to low. And you can actually see the, the, uh, the, the legend here in the middle of the, uh, in the middle of the chart showing you that. So each bar is a column or each column is an individual column. So we want to create basically a column chart. Now it's got a min and a max and it's got these different layers. We need to work that out, but let's, so the way that we started was just to build a basic column chart. So that's what we did. So here I just created a, a very basic column chart. On the left-hand side, I've just got the, my Vega light code. On the right-hand side, uh, you can see a basic column chart and I use the maximum temperature as my basic column. And it's kind of sweeping down how I would expect it to do. And if you could see the whole column, which you, the whole chart there, you could see it sweeps back up again at the end of the year. So I've got this piece of code that basically works, right? It's a start, it starts and it works. There's no errors, there's no issues. I'm ready to begin kind of iterating now on my code. So I start with a very simple working system. And then it's really just a matter of doing simple iterative prompts. Now I'm pretty irreverent with ChatGPT when I talk to it. Uh, I said, nice one, you're the best. Here's some Vega Lite code. Now what I said there was to begin this was I said, do you know Vega Lite? Are you familiar with the, with the, uh, I didn't know whether ChatGPT would know it or not. And he said, yeah, yeah, I know Vega Lite and here is the thing and I'm familiar with the syntax and I can help you. And I was like, nice one, you're the best. Here's some Vega Lite code. I need it to be a column chart, not a bar chart. Can you change it? So that was the first thing. It started off as a bar chart that ran horizontally and it turned it into a column chart. My output was what I got down the bottom. And you can see I got a basic column chart. And that's perfect. A simple system and it completely worked. So then we needed to move to the next step. So my next step, I was like, well, I've got a column chart now that moves, that has all of my max values. I want to get my min values now. So I want it to be the min uh, being the, the lower bounds of the column and the max being the higher bounds. And I said something to that effect. I said, awesome, that works, except we need to change the date to a temporal type on the x-axis. There was a problem with the date. And we need to make the column have a min and max value. The min temperature measure will set the lower bounds of the column and the max temp will set the upper bounds. Can you do this, right? So I gave it another very simple kind of uh, instruction. And I use the output from the previous prompt. So I copy and paste the code into the prompt potentially each time if I feel like it's going to forget. Now, one of the things you have to be careful of is that, you know, ChatGPT only has a certain amount of memory. It's going to lose context after a certain number of prompts, particularly if it's generating a reasonable amount of code. There's only so far back it can go. So you may need to reset the uh reset the the model every now and then and often what i will do is if i feel like i've gone in the wrong direction i will copy and paste that code out of the chat completely i'll start a whole new chat give it a whole new set of context okay we're up to here and this is what we're doing and here's here's the current code and then start again the reason why I do that is I do feel like it will go down. If it goes down a path, it will that 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 wrong turn will be included in the history and it will always kind of remember that. Now you can kind of say to it, hey, forget the last thing you did. Do you want to, you know, or 
maybe can you take the thing from two things, you know, two prompts ago? You don't really want to get into that space. So if that does happen, you feel like it's taken a turn in a direction that you're not happy with or it doesn't, it's not going to work, you will need to potentially completely restart and reset things. And uh, if you're in the in the business of building solutions in the prompting world, and we'll talk maybe a little bit more about you know what I think the implications of that are, then you'll need to consider that too. Is it how do you completely wipe the slate clean and then start again? All right, so we got the output that we were expecting. We got a min and a max value in a column chart. So this is fantastic. So we're using the output from the previous prompt to feed this prompt. So then yet another one that works great. Thanks, you rule. Uh, we're going to add a layer that is the average as a line over the top of the column chart. The measure is called the all time average. So I had a measure for all time average. Basically the way that Deneb works is it has this data set of values and you, you feed it in the values that you want. Um, and so it put this red line over the top. It chose the color red. I didn't choose the color, but I didn't end up using this all time average value, but I did want to see if I could generate the all, a line that showed the all time average value. Um, and then we did some extra bits and pieces to, to fix that up. So that worked well as well. Uh, like I said, I've got a little note here. ChatGPT will sometimes forget some context after a few prompts. So it's a good idea to either remind it or restart your chat periodically. Um, and keeping that kind of idea and obviously, you know, as new versions of these large language models come out, different models will have different capabilities and capacities. Uh, this will become less and less of a problem, hopefully. I still think though that going down the rabbit hole thing is going to be a problem for a while because I can't see you being able to, ex maybe you'll be able to delete prompts out of history to remove it from the context. Maybe something like, like that will help uh, with that. Uh, but essentially, we're, we're, you can see we're iterating, iterating, getting slightly more towards where we wanted to go. So then the next next prompt I said was nice work. You're really great. <laughs> I'm, I'm always polite. <laughs> we like we like to add another column that represents the all time high and the all time low. This is the in a lighter color and it sits underneath the main column measure for all time for the all time high. The measure for the all time high is all time max and the measure for the all time low is all time min. Now, that was probably... I would say that's about the limit of things you want to give it in a single prompt. So this is what I'm talking about. A, a large number of small, simple prompts is going to be more effective than trying to write it all in a single, super complex, you every, solve everything at once prompt. There's maybe three instructions there. I'm adding another column, this light gray column that's appeared in the bottom area that shows all time high and low. I told it it's going to be a lighter color. I told it it's going to sit back. So that means it's going to sit underneath the other one. So there's a layering kind of aspect to this data visualization stuff. So it has to be on a different layer. And here's the two measure names. And I feel like that's probably the maximum number of things you kind of want to give it at any given time. If you don't want it to potentially kind of rearrange things. Another thing that can happen is that it can, um, it'll, it'll, it'll summarize code and it'll do things in a way that um, to make, you know, to save tokens and to make life easy for itself. If you give it a large chunk of code, one of the benefits of this Vega Light code, it's a relatively small snippet of code each time. There's only maybe sort of less than 40 or 50 lines in each in each snippet. So uh, ChatGPT can comfortably hold that in the time uh, that it that it has. Now, if you if you have a situation where you've got a very large snippet of code, then you'll need to potentially only give it snippets of that code. So that means you are responsible for understanding the way that those two pieces interact with each other and all that kind of stuff as well. So obviously this is another capacity issue that potentially will get better with time, but you do need to be careful about how much you're giving it at any given time. So small snippets and do small iterations is going to be, give you the best results from what I've discovered so far anyway, in terms of my, uh, in terms of my working with this tool. And then you just keep doing that over and over again. I'm not going to bore you with every single prompt. There's actually a video and I'll give you the link at the end of the presentation to me on YouTube, building this data visualization from end to end. It goes, there's three one hour sessions that we, we do it in. Um, and you can see every single prompt that I do to, to make it. But in the end, when humans and AI work together, anything is possible. So we'll skip ahead 
and we ended up with a data visualization that looks like this, right? So we, we solved a whole bunch of issues on the way through to, to get to this point. And like I said, there's no way I could have written a single prompt to give you this data visualization. And we tried, we told ChatGPT, hey, can you give me a prompt that, um, that would write this? And it, and, and it, it spat something out, but it's n never going, it, it, it didn't give it the, and then we copied that prompt and pasted it back into ChatGPT, but we didn't get the same outcome. And that is just because it's just, there's just too much going on here. Uh, you can see we've got the, you know, I've added this interactivity so you can see what it looks like when it's animated. But when you select different years, uh, we've got three charts now actually on the, on the final visualization. We've got these white lines running through the chart. We've got these horizontal um, dark gray lines showing us the months. We've got these uh, total rainfall chart in the middle here that where rain comes down from the roof of the chart with little raindrops on the end of the on the end of the bars. There's a cumulative rainfall graph that looks like the original. So you can see that a whole lot of stuff. Now this only took, if you had have asked me at the beginning of this, uh, I didn't know if it was possible or not when I first started this. And if you had have asked me at the beginning whether, uh, how long it would take for someone to write to build this kind of as a custom visual, you'd expect a quote for a week, maybe two weeks to build something like this. So for ChatGPT to be able to generate the code required for this in only three hours is unbelievably good. So that's a really great outcome. Um, since experimenting with this in the mean in 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 the meantime, there's been I've I've had a couple of failures where I've tried to build something that hasn't quite worked, and I've had some really good successes again as well. So it's not going to be absolutely perfect every time, and you know you're gonna you're gonna run into similarly even when you're just building prompt engineering just for a regular. Uh, for regular work, you're gonna. Some prompts are really good and they work really easily. Some prompts are going to be a little bit more difficult. Um, I think that's true here as well. That also comes down to how much knowledge you have around the tool. Now, I didn't know anything about Vega Light, and I didn't know anything about Deneb or the way that the uh, that JSON specification. I know what I'm talking about when it comes to data vis visualization. I knew what I wanted, but I didn't know the syntax of the language, which made it a really good. Although I am. To be fair, I am familiar with a lot of programming language. So I know a lot of kind of programming kind of fundamentals. So I think that put me in a good place to be somebody to experiment in this way with this particular language. I think there's a certain amount of base knowledge you need to be able to achieve this type of stuff, but it's you don't need to go in with having really strong syntactical uh, knowledge of the specific language that you're talking about. You just need to know the fundamentals, I think, around these types of things. Uh, some quick tips and tricks about what I discovered while I'm using ChatGPT. Uh, the model's built on human conversation and if you're polite, you get better outcomes. There was actually something released from Microsoft just recently where they said, um, this is true, right? So that if you have a, if you've got a good vibe, it's all about the vibes with the model. Uh, and look, I think it's more fun if you do it this way as well. And you saw the way that I kind of speak to the, to the model with my prompts. I'm pretty irreverent. Um, you don't have to spell anything right. I love that. You just, you know, write it in and, and it'll figure out what you mean most of the time. Um, and if it doesn't, it'll probably ask. So, uh, I think, I think being polite, being friendly and make it fun. That's the best way to interact with these large language models. It's trained on human interaction. Why not make it a fun interaction? Uh, starting simple, like we have, you know, that's kind of the point of this. Start with a basic working output and iterate and build complexity into that as you go. You will go down the wrong path. And if you watch the full video, you'll be able to see me. I go in the wrong direction a few times. Uh, but we bring it back, you know, we bring it back and uh, and then we start again and, and we, we get there in the end. Uh, and it doesn't take very long to, to reset, right? The great thing about this whole idea and one of the tips here is document your iterations, right? The fact that you've got this prompt history means that you've got all of the um, all of the history of the code that you had in the past, so you can always go back and pick up the code as you went. Or if you're using good kind of code-based uh, uh, version control systems like Git, then that's obviously relatively straightforward as well. Uh, keep your uh, keep your mind focus on the end goal. Always important. Uh, maintain clarity and effectiveness. You, it is important because it will 
that there's that rabbit hole effect that tends to happen when you're dealing with things, particularly when you're doing things iteratively, you, you will find yourself straying off into strange places and you need to stay focused on the main goal. What are you actually trying to achieve? Try and iterate towards that rather than trying to iterate towards everything. Uh, and then utilize feedback. So, you know, in this case, it was mostly just me. I actually did this in front of with, a, with the community. So as part of the kind of Power BI community, we have a session every Friday and um, the community were there and they were providing feedback as well about what they thought, how they thought things should go. Uh, utilize if you if you're building anything you should always utilize uh, you end user feedback and analytics as much as possible so do what you can to get it in front of people and ask them how you think you should change it it's much easier to change things iteratively like that with simple user feedback and if you're going for user feedback one tip I'll give you is that you should be specific about the type of feedback that you need right so ensure that you say well what do you think of the color of this not what do you think of this chart or visualization or what do you think of this game or what do you think of this software I'm building? You know, be specific about the type of feedback you need. Um, it's, uh, it will make a huge difference. So that's it. Hopefully you enjoyed this session on building complex data visualizations using ChatGPT. Uh, if you've got any questions, then do feel free to hit me up on LinkedIn. I am probably in the Discord answering questions right now. Um, uh, hopefully, I've managed. Uh, hopefully, it's not at a time where I'm in the middle of the night or anything like that. Uh, it's great to see you all. Thank you so much for coming to my session. Um, if you want to catch up with me, then feel free to ping me. Um, I'm more than happy to have a chat, particularly about anything to do with prompt engineering. I think it's a really great area, a uh, really interesting area to work in. And I look forward to hopefully seeing some of the other sessions in the in this uh, in this uh, conference, and also seeing what you guys are doing out there in the in the world. And and hopefully uh, you can share that with me. So thank you very much, and yeah, we'll see you next time. Cheers. Bye. Thank you so much, Greg. I love good vibes and the session was amazing and actually got me thinking that the visualizations I've done with ChatGPT, yeah, um, I guess it's a time to update some YouTube videos because this was incredibly inspiring. So definitely connect with Greg. We are posting some links to connect with us during the session so you can always ping us as well on LinkedIn or, you know, subscribe to our channels. However, talking about good vibes, I'm excited for you to, I'm excited to introduce you to the next speaker, Jan Kranz. And Jan is also known as full-time business hippie. So talk about vibes. He serves as the global director for collective intelligence at Eidos. With over 18 years at the company, he has been a pioneering force in the collaboration and technology. Jan is also a member of Eidos scientific community and a former lecturer at the huge university where he shaped the future of work for the next generations. So Jan's presentation is going to be really inspiring. And if you have still left any kind of doubts, is prompt engineering a thing, you go, you are for a treat. prompt engineering and how it can empower each of us to do stuff you could not imagine you would ever do. Because you don't have the skills or the time, but with the right mindset, I'm sure you can. Let me introduce myself. I'm Jan Krans and I'm working for Ethos, a global IT service provider delivering foundational IT services and we have a team of more than 50,000 people. At the moment, I support our team by leading ARC, the Ethos Research Community, a network community of 900 technical experts and future thinkers. One of our main R&D topics is the future of work and how generative AI will shape tomorrow's organization. Yes, we believe that prompting will rock the business world, led by people who embrace the new technology and go where they have never been before to create remarkable results in a fraction of time. But saying something is one. Really doing it is something else. So just for the holiday break, I was thinking to myself, what kind of experiment could be done to prove this? And then it was the 1st of August, August, holiday time. And since I'm living in The Hague, that means beach time. While taking some of the pictures at the beach, here's one of them. 
The experiment question was popping up again and then it dawned on me. The power of prompting has everything to do with the mindset and the work title for the experiment floated in my brain. Let's call, call it the power of prompting, rocket fuel for people with a growth mindset. Here's the proof. Great title. What I'm sharing today is the experience of this creative digital journey to find out if an individual like you or me can achieve something which wasn't possible before. If you don't master the skills and have it have a sea of time for learning. But now, with the right mindset and generative AI tools like ChatGTP, Midjourney and the like, you have the power of the prompt and it should be possible or not. But before we start, first a few words on mindset. Generally speaking, you could say there are two. There are people with a fixed mindset, boxing their talents and possibilities because they are risk averse, afraid of failure, thinking in problems and obstacles. And you know what happens if you float a new idea. They will be the first to say that will not work because reason one, two, three, four, or if it's affecting themselves, they think I can do it. Too much uncertainty. I don't have the experience. It will never work, but they are missing the point. It doesn't have to work the first time. It's, it isn't about failure or success. It's about trying something new, breaking through imaginary barriers. Why would you limit yourself not trying and keep on doing what you always did? Because then you know for sure you will get what you always got. Do you really want that? Or do you prefer to experiment and have an open mind? Take some uncalculated risks, really believing that something is worth trying and failing fast. Great. This will keep the learning going. So try again to improve or do something completely different. Feed your passion and go for it with a growth mindset. Okay, enough of that. Let's move on with the journey to show the power of prompting. First, we have to find a project to experiment with and it should not be too business-like. It should be fun whilst still proving our main hypothesis. So there we have it. Do you know Tarot or Oracle cards? Which you can use to get some new insights for a certain situation you are in or getting some alternative direction for a question which is hunting you for a while? I guess you do. So we're gonna create a new Oracle card deck. And here's our backlog. We want to have a visual deck of cards, an, an Oracle AI app, an ebook, and a web shop. And we have one sprint of two weeks with a team of one, prompting away with some support of Google and YouTube. All right, first stop. We have to have a name for our project. Instead of brainstorming for a few hours, we could better feed the context of our project into the prompt and ask JTP to come up with some names. And we, we picked two and mixed it up. And there we had it. We call our project Mystic Fusion. Awesome, but now we need a philosophy for the Mystic Fusion uh, cards to give it a character and we need also descriptions of those cards. So let's start prompting and putting the results in two different Word documents. The one with all the card info, we ask GTP to transform it into a CSV, which the AI app can use to retrieve the card details when needed. Wait, I don't have any coding skills. It was 30 to 40 years ago when I was playing with, my, with BASIC on my Commodore 64 and later I did some lingo in my Macromedia Director. Face it John, you are a noob on an impossible mission. Was the reaction of some. While Googling, I stumbled on Streamlit. This will ease the workload. It takes away the whole web app deployment since you can deploy it with one click if you have a GitHub repository. Okay, first things first. Let's build the app with my partner in crime, GTP. That were some rough days, I can say. But in the end, it was working locally. Okay. GitHub thing and deploy it on the Streamlit cloud. Luckily, I found some guidance provided by the data professor and I was very excited if it will work.
just yet. Let's space the question. Check if the card symptoms are there. Let's stick to, to the single card draw. Okay, put in the number. Okay, now it's time to tell my Mystic Fusion reading, please. And yes, it is working. It's performing the open API call. Let's wait for a bit. Yes, there it is. The Oracle reading. Let's read together. It's not bad, do you think? It's good enough to go. Next, the real fun part, creating the visuals for, for the cards fit mid-journey. First, you have to find an art style, art style. In this case, I've picked Samsara. Then set the right aspect ratio for your playing cards, 58 by 88. The prompt for creating the images for all the cards is coming from the card description document we made in the beginning. Do you remember? Cool. Now, all of a sudden, we have 52 cards and it was not really looking forward to do the titling by hand in Affinity Photo. So, off to YouTube to find if we can automate it. And yes, there was this great video of Affinicast. Just record one mark macro, run it and lay back. Okay, done. What's next? Let's find a place to print the cards and not breaking the bank since we need only one deck of cards and, and not hundreds. With a bit of googling, I found Kuji.nl and created the deck in their designer. The deck should be like normal playing cards, so you can shuffle them with ease uh, and the pack will fit in your pocket. The thinking was, if, you, if the deck fits in your pocket, you could easily bring them to, to the dinner parties or other gatherings. There you could play it together, formulating questions, uh, type in it in the mobile app, then draw some cards, like this one, and let the Mystic Fusion Oracle do its magic to come up with an answer ne when needed. Do you need more clarification? Use the ebook, which is on your phone. The content of the ebook is mostly generated by GTP and edited afterwards. It has all the 52 cards with description and how to play section and women's interested. There's also something like the Mystic Fusion philosophy. Okay, the app is working. We already printed the cards. Now there is one stop, creating a web shop. It took just two to three hours. It's so simple with your web, but .nl or any other what you see is what you get editor. I like this one because it integrated the payment module from Molly, which has Ideal, and that is one of the supported systems, payment systems in the Netherlands, which is more or less the standard. I love this whole API economy thing. So the last step, the Molly configuration, which I unfortunately couldn't finish because I had no business registration. And then I thought, why don't start a business? So up to the Chamber of Commerce. And a few weeks later, I walked out their building as a founder. Website done, experiment done. Oh, wait, there's one more thing. I replaced the Streamlit Community Cloud and, and, and now the new web app is running on AWS EC2. Did some Linux in between. Still some work to do, like DNS, SSL certificate, a user management system, but that's for later. To close this talk, I think it's very fair to say, based on, on this experiment, executed in two and a half weeks, that the power of prompting is indeed rocket fuel for people with a growth mindset. What are you going to do with your power? Which imaginary boundaries are you surpassing with your projects? So do yourself a favor, say yes to the opportunity to change your future of work by engineering the most innovative and productive prompts you can. The only limit is your own creativity. And above all, have fun guys, I know I did. Okay, guys, if this wasn't vibes, I don't know what is vibes. Thank you so much, Jan, for inspiring uh, presentation and really sharing your story. I can specifically resonate. I recently was speaking on the stage in Spain for startups and venture capital. And I used this reference when people say that I tried AI, but, and you can insert whatever reason, it didn't work for me. And the reference I used that I tried to get a six pack, but it didn't really work for me by going one time to the gym. Uh, so definitely this is really exploratory journey and testing and sky's the limit. Okay, so personal stories done. Um, we are going to move to the last speaker of this session. And I want you to meet Alexander Holmset. And Alexander Holmset is a senior cloud consultant at Cloudway and an MVP 
in office, apps, and services. With, the, with an international speaker profile, he is a notable voice in the fields of Skype for Business, Teams, Microsoft 365, and various automation technologies, specializing in logic apps, Power Automate and Graph API, he combines his expertise with a strong passion for PowerShell scripting. A strong advocate for automation, his motto encapsulates his approach. If you're going to do something more than once, then automate it. And this is exactly what Alexander is going to share with us. So get ready for the speaker. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session on how to debug PowerShell with prompt engineering. My name is Alexander Holmerstadt, and I work as a senior cloud consultant in a company called Cloudway. And over the past years, I've been doing a lot around PowerShell and Graph API. But my newfound love within technology now is AI, of course. It's so exciting. And today we're going to use Azure OpenAI Studio and the chat playground with the GPT 4 32K model to take a look at some PowerShell issues, even for basic users. So, if I had a tool like this when I started with PowerShell, this would be so helpful. Not having to post on a forum and wait a couple of hours to get a reply to see why didn't your script work. So, we're going to start up fairly simple there's a i'll copy in a short script it uh, gets all the users in uh, active directory and then loops through them to set some information now let's add some text a prompt uh, here at start why is this script not doing anything to the users. Let's see here. Ah, there's a typo in my script. I use two R's instead of one R in users. And it even came out with a, a better version of the script with uh, that error corrected. That's amazing. Look at this. How quick and simple this was. No need for posting in forums anymore. Or sometimes, of course, but uh, this is amazing how quick it is. Let's take another example of a script that uh, gets all Azure AD users and sets some property to a mailbox. Why is this not working? It uses the dollar user attribute to then set the mailbox. Okay, the get ad command returns an object that includes user principal name, not a identity which is required by set mailbox. You should modify the script to use user principal instead of identity. So it does dollar user dot user principal name instead of the whole object that was the error this time and this is still amazing that see how simply you get these answers and an, another thing i work with the graph api and powershell and i have a meeting room calendar and a users calendar and i want to see if to calendar event objects from these two different calendars is the same meeting. So I copy these two calendar events and let's uh, write something here first. Is there any property in these two calendar events I can use to see if they are the same meetings. Let's paste. Huh. 
Okay, to determine if the two events are part of the same meetings, you can check the iCal UD. Huh. And here's the ID from the first event and from the second. And it, as you see, uh, it says, as you can see, they are the same. So these two events are part of the same meeting series. Oh, this is amazing. Like, look at this, all these de details. I guess you can do some of it with PowerShell comparing and stuff like that, but I didn't know which property I could use to identify them. So this way, I um, could just paste all these two objects and just ask which one can use to look at the same. But uh, let me do a small change to the iCal UD in some of the in one of the object and let's ask it again is the i cal uid in these two objects the same no I can do it for the first event is and it's like this. And I have seen doing this comparison earlier also, it says if I've just switched out, say one or two characters, it says uh, it's very similar, but not the same. So this, this again is very amazing. Let's look at something else. Uh, can ChatGPT help us write PowerShell scripts? Let's start with a simple command. So, and I'm also on the Mac, so let's add that to the prompt. Can you write a PowerShell command that lists all root folders on my Mac? Okay, get child item and directory. Slash, let's copy this and see what it does. Yeah, it lists all the root folders. That's good. Well, let's ask it again. Uh, can you make a script out of this and loop? all the root folders and get the child items. Okay, get child item and read roots through loops through them. Okay, let's copy this one. And let's just paste it, see what it does. Wow, I did that fairly quickly. It looped through all the root folders and got all the child items. This is again, very amazing. Okay, let's see what we can do with Azure OpenAI and PowerShell and do some requests through PowerShell. So it's using the uh, REST API to do requests against Azure OpenAI. And I'm not going to get into details how to set up and stuff like that, but you can go to my blog, alexholmes.blog and see some blog posts on how you get started with this. But let's do something simple here. Can you write a PowerShell script that creates a for each loop and count to 10. Let's see. Okay, let's run this. OK, 
Okay, that looks uh, promising. And let's paste this. Yeah, and it counted to 10. Amazing. And this was unfortunately all we had time for in this session today. But I really enjoyed speaking at this first ever prompt engineering conference. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the sessions there. Thank you, Alexander. And hi again. <laughs> and everybody say hi to Greg. And we also have Jan as well. Um, guys, this was incredibly impressive. And I just need to point out, I think, Greg, this is your channel that you wrote that from this point, you will be writing ton of this type of stuff to clean up all the old family photos on PC, 100%. If I would knew how to write code, I would do the same. Exactly, right? Yes. Um, okay, so Greg, there is a little bit of mic scratching on your side sensitivity. Um, but I will kick off with a couple of questions and maybe we start with Alexander. So the questions um, to you about security concerns. Um, mm. Yes, do you have security concerns given an AI access to core OS systems such as PowerShell? Do you foresee potential abuse of AI to obtain private information from the end user when giving them access? Any pointers here? Uh, in regards of uh, for all PowerShell code, you should at least be able to read and understand what the code will do to your system. And when you come into AI, like like with uh, Windows Copilot, I listened to a podcast, and from what I understand, it can't really do system changes on your behalf. It can tell you what to do. But it can open application and stuff like that, but no central Windows system settings. So right. uh, I don't really have a high concern about that, but it's something to be mindful of, of course. Thank you for this answer. And uh, Jan, I think you're going to like this comment. Uh, well, Poop, sorry, please don't block me on YouTube, uh, says that he's inspired to make his own deck of cards it's so cool. Uh, thank you for your inspirational um, presentation. Uh, we have a question to you about more philosophical discussion. So do you think philosophical discussions with an AI will yield results that can help positively grow a person seeking spiritual guidance? So I think you know what my answer will be. Um, I, I, I really believe in the human and machine collaboration and paradigm. And the great thing is that you don't talk to one machine, you can talk to five or six at the same time. So what you could do in your prompt is uh, implement multiple characters and they can play each a different role. So actually you can ask one question and let the AI do the discussion. And then afterwards you can step in. So, so yeah, my answer is yes, because you can, it is not only a um, discussion, it is also helping to form an opinion uh, yourself. It's, you can talk to friends, but you can also talk to an AI and you have seven or eight friends in the prompt. Not that I'd say that, that I prefer, of course, the prompt. <laughs> um, always a good uh, human conversation is always better, but it's really stimulating your thinking. I think, yeah, for me, it's a full, moon, full yes. And by the way, there's some other tip I want to give. If you're a man, and you want to do prompt engineering, you have to grow a beard. That is what I learned if I look at this session. <laughs> well, well, I am bringing diversity. You you got to get, get some girls without beards. Come on, guys. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I love the beard game. <laughs> That's true. Um, all right. So the data visualization, Greg, this was incredible completely could relate to the house analogy it was the whole time like nodding on this one um and i got a couple of questions for you so 
let's uh, let's yeah. start with this one uh, because Darth Looper, come on, guy, the best questions, the best. Then this is this is excuse me. This is five hours. I'm definitely getting done. No, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so then I can read it if you yeah. like. <laughs> Please, native English speakers, <laughs> help me out. Um, okay. When visualizing me... the data, do you experience bias in data display, giving first glance misleading results such as improper bar sizes, poor color choices, inaccurate percentages versus bar pie size, etc.? This is a big consideration in data visualization. We we talk about this a lot. We have this concept of of um, uh, data dishonesty and 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 lying um, using data, which is something that. Um, that we're we're always fighting against. So there's a big um, consideration around. Uh, common things are where you start your bars at not at zero, so you you provide a provide a, uh, a misleading uh, bar sizes by starting them at a different thing other than zero. You have another thing where if you use something like a 3D pie graph that represents volume instead of area, we're we're always fighting against these types of things. And so um, it's pretty mature in the data visualization world where we um we're, we're very aware of it and most tools are, are are built in a way that doesn't pro you know doesn't allow for too much sort of data dishonesty if you like uh, thank you for this um answer and the follow-up question is how do you keep and ensure accuracy in the data set handled by ai what processes do you utilize to check the data being extrapolated <laughs> Yeah, so the data is the hard bit, as we say in data visualization, and so the actually the visualization part is 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 the easy part, and and when you come to uh, when it comes to data quality and data uh, things like so you've got a few different considerations, you've got security of the data, and then obviously the accuracy of the data, and and I I think we're a little ways away from leaving that purely to AI to 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 provide because of the sort of black box na black box nature of kind of AI models uh, we need to we need to have a certain amount of rigor over d certain data sets if you've got particularly things like uh, GDPR related data sets anything to do with personal personally private personal uh, identifiable information then then we need to have a certain amount of vision over what's happening to that data in the back end. So I think you'll find in the data world that um, people won't necessarily leave it 100% to AI um, for data accuracy purposes. With that, with that being said, though, I've never seen really an example where where anything, uh, any kind of AI analysis has gotten anything wrong. So we're yet to sort. Of, it's still an undiscovered kind of world. I think where we've uh, we, we're still uncovering what the possibilities are and what can it do and what can't it do reliably and accurately if you like yeah exactly and um this question about historical data uh and especially health data and now we have also you know uh ChatGPT can see here and interact with you and um the follow-up to this was actually exploring wayback machine so my question really to you and maybe to all of you um Coming down to the data, what are what excites you to explore data with ChatGPT, be it the undiscovering personalities or exploring philosophical topics or writings? Um, any explorations with historical data that you already did, and at what scale, and anything that excites you in the future? I will go first. YouTube. I just want to understand YouTube historical data on thumbnails and titles and then I'm ready to you know rock fully but um yeah anything on your sides um Gre Alexander Greg whoever wants to jump in no oh, I spend all day every day <laughs> messing <laughs> okay. around with different data sets so um so I, I obviously do it obviously a lot with commercial data but um there was the, it's interesting to 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 compare some of the analysis that the that the the large language models do compared to what real people do, you know, and 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 doing almost side by side analysis with with what's happening in the real world. Unfortunately, I don't have too many I can share because they're all private 
private pieces, but uh, <laughs> that weather data is the only public data that I've um, that I've been messing around with um, recently. But yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, we're really only just starting in this space. There's a there's a long way to go. Um, yeah. Uh, this more I'm playing around with survey data. Uh, actually, I'm playing around with survey data of 20 years ago that I still have. Uh, to figure out if my statistics were right. <laughs> and guess what? I got my degree, but my statistics were wrong. Because now you can so analyze so quickly. So if you use, everybody's using Microsoft Forms, right? For, to, to get collect data and do a survey, get some insights. And then you have all the statistics. And what do they do? They put it in Excel and you get the only the average and, and, and nothing else. And the data doesn't talk. With the ChatGTP, you can go to the next level. Although you have this challenge that you, you can put it forward, don't put it on the public version. But if you are lucky and you have, uh, you have this, this crop available in, a, in Azure, then you can with a, with a good heart and upload your company data because it's protected, it's secure, it stays with your own Azure instance. And then you can do this analysis and it pays back huge because it saves so much time for so many people. Because actually, I think. The, the biggest thing that it's going to bring is going to democratize um, data and data analytics. And I think that's going to be the strong point. If people just try to take the first step and when you're in the flow tunnel, you go all the way. That's my experience, at least. Um, yeah. Alexander, any pointers? Yeah. Um, for years now, I've been looking at the uh, usage in M365, how people use Teams, how people use OneDrive and so on. And having all, uh, for some customers, I store historical data in SQL databases uh, for how users watched like three years ago. And with AI, I see that you can more easily and make it more accessible to do a comparison year by year, ask for which trends use that AI see in the data even though you're not a data scientist, it makes it a lot more accessible for the masses. Yeah, and um, I have a question to actually all of you. So what is your biggest joy and biggest frustration working with large language, uh, with large language, what, oh my God, what's going on? Um, you know what I mean? Um, because yeah. as exciting as it is, I think we all, you know, run into some hurdles throughout experimentation. So any tips, any issues that you overcome and any frustrations that you're looking forward for solutions, maybe, you know, community can help out addressing some. Uh, I have one, uh, like the example from uh, my presentation on comparing uh, meeting events uh, okay. when testing. Uh, it uh, first try, it said, no, there's uh, nothing that can be used to put these two events together. And then you try again, ask it, clear the history, try again. Ah, oh, there's this uh, parameter here that you can use to compare them together. So it, it's, as most people have discovered, uh, when it's wrong, it try to persuade you that it's right. So you need to have that. Back in back of your mind. And just to add you, this is kind of maybe conversation about more hallucinations, but I plugged yeah. um, chat GPT, uh, GPT 3.5 to Google Sheets. This was in very early days to test prompts. So basically, I would just ask a prompt and just, you know, drag it and play with variables. And I remember I just wanted, you know, some kind of synthetic data and I asked for names. And like there was like, it gives names. And then sometimes it was like, as a large language model, I can't generate names. And I was like, yeah, right, you know? Um, so yeah. Anyway, so this was my frustrations in the early days. Now testing has advanced. Um, and then, yeah, Prompt Hub, definitely check it out. OK, Greg, any frustrations with data visualizations? Um, uh, it's anything, certainly, like, well, yeah. I think I think mirroring your your own experiences, it's very convincing when it's wrong. in in mm -hmm. our In our world, we write a lot of uh, DAX language, which is um, which is pa the Power BI uh, calculation language, like Excel formulas or sheet formulas, Google Sheets formulas. And um, there's not a lot. So it's unlike Python, which which ChatGPT is fantastic at. 
because there's so much information out there online and it's obviously been trained on on that and similarly with javascript where you're dealing with a, a computer language that doesn't necessarily have a lot of information out there it's very very convincing in when it goes down a, the wrong rabbit hole and you have to be very careful there's been instances where i've been where it's invented whole new functions and described exactly what that function and i was like well uh, this looks correct like it it, it 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 mirrored so closely what a real function would look like i thought it was a function i hadn't heard of and i had to go back to the references and check that this if this function existed and it didn't it was a it had just hallucinated a, a, a whole new function for a, a capability that this language didn't have at all and so, so I think that, and, and particularly, you know, using this kind of iterative method that I kind of speak about is that I'm always looking for it to go down where, where it, I feel like it's starting to go down a bit of a rabbit hole. And I want to bring it back to kind of where it was and start a new chat or refresh the history and, and clear the history and continue again, you know, like that, that is, uh, that's definitely a big uh, frustration, but I, th I think on the joy side, it's so much fun, right? So, yes. <laughs> so yeah, I don't mind at all. Yeah. Um, Jan, what uh, what did you run into? So in the beginning, uh, it was a little bit frustrating, but also I was surprised when I was doing um, yeah a little bit of market research using ChatGPT and. Then I always ask, okay, provide me with the references uh, because to check if it's hallucinating or not. And then you see all these nice links. And then you click the link and then the website doesn't exist. <laughs> uh, so that's one, that's one of, yeah. So, okay, uh, get used to it, but uh, hopefully it will be fixed. I know why it is, it's fine. So you can always go the different route and go to uh, link chat, and then you can do the same kind of stuff. So I would advise you to do that one if you want to have a source from the internet. On the joy side, you can make fun with this thing. Is this thing? I don't know if you see my system. You had to share a prompt, right, before for this for the NCF conference. And at that time, I was thinking playing uh, with ChatGPT to write a satiric uh, scientific article based on two terms. So it could be bureaucracy and management. And then it's going to write the whole story <laughs> around the two, two things. And that makes me smile every time because you just put two words and then you get the story. And that's so fun. So if you start your day with something like that, you're set for the, for the rest of the, of the day, for sure. So that's the fun part. Yeah, um, no, thank you all for sharing the stories. Um, I have a couple of more questions for you. And this one, I think it was directed to Greg, but I kind of want to a little bit expand it to all of you. So the question is, how do you align simple iterative prompt between developers and shared apps? Is there a repository for shared prompts, for example? So to broaden up the question to all of you, um, where do you go for prompts or inspiration for prompts? And also, how do you manage your prompts? So this is like kind of expanded touch on whichever point you want to go into first. Um, but yeah, I'm just curious, you know, like where do you store everything and how do you iterate? Uh, I'll go quickly first, I guess. So um, just quickly, yeah, the... So I think this is an, an, uh, an emerging area is about collaborative prompting, you know, like I think we need, there's a bit of work to do there, a, a, a sort of branch merge or GitHub style um, uh, of, of uh, technology would be great. I don't know of anything that exists right now, but. Oh my uh, God. Would, okay. Greg, yeah. I have okay. To we just invented it. something. <laughs> no, prompt uh, hub, prompt uh, prompt hub, yeah. US is yeah, like yeah, a yeah. GitHub, right? Okay, yes. sorry, didn't yeah. mean to. Interrupt. No, that's okay. Please continue. Yeah, I'll have to look into the features whether that you can you can all collaborate on a single prompt. That'd be interesting to know. Um, the uh, but yeah, prompt hub is great. There's um, I when I'm looking for prompt inspiration, I like there's a lot of YouTube YouTubers out there at the moment that I think are doing really interesting thing. All about AI is my go-to uh, guy for um, for prompting at the moment. I think he's doing really interesting stuff in in the prompting space but yeah that's kind of where i'm at with that 
Uh, thank you. I was kind of patiently waiting for you to say like, "Oh, gotta go channel." I also subscribe oh, to. I gotta you. go, of course. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I subscribe to your channel, so just so you know, um, excited I'm to watch. I'm pretty sure this. I've subscribed to yours. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, Alexander, um, how do you handle your prompting journey? Uh, I I do a lot of working within the PowerShell space and stuff like that. So I follow a lot of people on Twitter that uh, do a lot with Azure Open AI and API calls. So that's where I learned how to use uh, good props from getting uh, written a function in PowerShell, a script even. But uh, there's a lot of inspiration on Twitter actually. But I don't have any good system for storing uh, prompts I have used and stuff like that. But you have to start thinking about that, of course. Um, just to add, like I recently really discovered superpower ChatGPT extension. It's Google Chrome extension, so it allows. But this is for specifically ChatGPT, but yeah. it really allows you like a folder storing of your prompts and a little bit of management. Okay, Jan, anything you can share? Yeah, there's chaos over here in the Netherlands storing prompts. <laughs> um, so, so I tried different systems and nothing was working actually. So I started in a simple way and I ended up in Scrivener. I don't know if you know Scrivener. It's used to write books or scenarios for movies. And then you can drag everything uh, uh, across. Text base looks a little bit like uh, Trello, but then for writing. Uh, so that's helped me a lot. <clears throat> and on the company side, uh, we have a prompt store. So we, since we are working on the prompt store, we are now uh, testing it. And, and this works actually great. So uh, employees can share their prompt uh, so that they can use each other's prompt. And they can also like it and give them a an rating. So we know which prompts work best. And then we can take a look at it. Not me, but the experts, expert prompt uh, engineers, to see if we can improve it even more. Uh, one tip is put your prompt that you have, is really working great, put it in ChatGPT again, and ask if you can improve the prompt. So it can be very easy sometimes. And, and it could also be uh, very helpful. Um, and on the other end, we also have the folders, but we use it for a different kind of way. But that goes much more in, in depth. Um, so, so that's how we managed to share the prompts. I, I wrote it down because I didn't know the prompt hub. So I can't, I can't, I can't check out for sure. So, so thanks for the tip. So probably I also have to subscribe to your channel. Uh, for that. <laughs> probably should. Sorry, yeah. Jan. <laughs> I'm not sorry. <laughs> uh, no, I'm, you know, I'm trying to kind of, because I myself, like I, I'm not as technical as you guys, uh, definitely. But I do know a little bit of, yeah, scripting, and I have, I think, general understanding. Plus, talking about historical data, I worked in big data analytics company for pricing intelligence for airlines. So basically, every time when you buy a ticket, that decision was made by the company I was working. And yeah, we've been writing about machine learning. And at that time, this is like three years ago, that was considered like in marketing was like, oh, that's too hype. Don't don't keep punching that everywhere. And now we see AI absolutely everywhere. Um, OK, so I have one question for Alexander. And this is a very specific one. Um, so you mentioned uh, that the method discussed can be also applied to other languages. Can you give an example of how prompt engineering could be ben benefiting debugging in other programming languages? Uh, I don't remember ex exact language, but I, I saw a demo from MS Build this summer with uh, Scott Hanselman, uh, and they wrote a uh, Asteroid game, and they got all the parts, the graphics, the coding, and debugging if they did something wrong. It came with suggestion. You had uh, GitHub Copilot inside of Visual Studio, and uh, do doing uh, uh, JavaScript, C plus, Objective, and stuff like that. It seems like a good fit. Okay, thank you for sharing that. Um, I would like to also ask Jan to elaborate, like, from the non-technical person to non-technical person, what potential do you see 
this is going to unlock to people who don't have maybe necessary technical background or have limited technical experience. Uh, and to narrow down the question, do you see that we maybe not, we won't need so much programming language or another route is that people without technical background will be able to so quickly get on board and use simple applications like you all just demonstrated? To be honest, I think yeah, always. <laughs> I think we need more programmers. Nice. Uh, why? Uh, because we can. It's not. It's not a closed system. It's not a box. It's not sitting in a box. The whole thing that we are doing. It's going outside of the box. So we're gonna create more and better stuff. That and and there we need programs. It's just like with low code. You know, you we can do a power app, right? Um, but you also have the the pro default power apps. Uh, so then you have to really know uh, your shit, otherwise the thing will not work. And I think the same applies to this as well. Uh, what I, but I also see a risk, uh, actually. So if you look at society, it's already in digital divide at the moment. I think it's going to be bigger, much bigger. If you don't, don't jump on this train, if you're gonna, gonna miss out, you think, oh, this going nowhere, I'm gonna be neglected. So that wasn't. Um, a study from Harvard Business Review, for example, I think it was published in September, and people that were using JTTP or other tools, uh, they were much more productive, saved a lot of time. So, so if you don't use it, even the digital divide within the workplace will take place. So people can outperform others with ease if you know how the prompt works. And if you know how the prompt works, then you can write a, a simple program, program just like I did. Uh, yeah, I studied Python a little bit, but okay. But if you want to write real code, good code, and that was what Greg was mentioning in his talk, you know, you have to know the frameworks and the systems and, and how software uh, is built. If you don't get this, then you end up in a mess. Uh, and your program will not work. But you had fun, you have learned a lot, but then somebody else has to take over. So the risk is, that uh, the, the maintenance of applications built by people like you and me uh, will be high. The scalability is also a risk. So does it scale? We don't know. It works. So great. <laughs> Let's go. But uh, that's not the whole story. So that's why you have this enterprise architects, this, this great guys that know how code really works. And, and if they, you put a team like that together, uh, yeah, you need them. Otherwise, um, you end up in a big mess than even before. It's just, uh, in my, I think with coding. Although, although uh, I'm very, very excited. Actually, I'm completely fired up uh, around uh, Cat of X. Uh, I think if you have a an, very good programmer who is uh, doing the start of the coding and you know the principles, that could be something, but I don't know yet. I didn't uh, put my hands on it yet. So maybe Greg was, or, or you have, or, or Alexander have already played with it. I've seen, seen the demos and whew, that could be <laughs> um, So you already got, got uh, spoiled, but I think Maxime is like, hey guys, you need to close, but I'm here in charge. So for, I uh, guess. <laughs> Uh, I really would like kind of like, you know, we are ending um, the stream and this conference. And I think what would be beautiful ending is a quick fire round of actually you either sharing one tool which is on top of your mind that you are using, um, any tips, inspiration, and you can also kind of pose a question to the audience that something is running on your mind. Um, if you're cool with that, uh, we can put Greg on the spotlight. Oh, I was trying to think of something. <laughs> now you really put me on the spotlight. Uh, what's on my mind at the moment? Um, I think we're right at the beginning, right? And we're still learning a whole new what human computer interaction. It's a, I think it's a, it's a really fantastic place. It's been, it's really inspiring to see what's happening and it's moving so fast. Uh, this concept of kind of co-pilot, um, is you know huge and yeah i i don't really have anything other than that other than to say <laughs> keep keep practicing and iterating right keep iterating and, and playing with it and keep the vibes up 
and uh, you'll uh, you'll have a lot of fun. And so subscribe to Greg's channel. I was already picking on your videos on data visualization. It's amazing. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Alexander? Yeah. Uh, as I showed in my demos using uh, Azure Open AI, and I've been playing around with creating a chatbot in Microsoft Teams that use Azure Open AI and internal SharePoint documents so you can get answers based from HR documents and stuff like that. So that's really fun. I've written a couple of blog posts around it on my blog, alexholmset.blog also. Fantastic. Really um, Jan? Yeah. yeah, for me it's not on tool. It is uh, finding like-minded people like we have done on during this conference. I think that's, that's the key because if you keep on share, sharing with each other, uh, we keep on moving and we keep on improving. I think that's the tool. It's not a tool, but yeah, the community, the virtual community, you can call the community software. So get some com good community software out there. That we can <laughs> all, our, all our stuff together. That would be awesome. The old um, networks, where are they? The web 2.0 space, where is it? Yeah, so I think we are very much in a building process and I definitely invite you to join Discord channels, um, both prompt uh, conference, prompt engineering conference, and also SymphMind. So we will be dropping some links in the chat. And with that, I really, I think it's time to, for five hour ending. So <laughs> this was crazy. I'm definitely kind of reconsidering um, Maybe Twitch streaming is the next career move. Um, but I just want to thank you all uh, for having this conversation and for your presentations. And this was incredibly insightful. And as you can see from the comments, it definitely people resonate for the value you bring. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, so um, I will remove our guest to the stage and I will just wrap, uh, have a short, quick wrap up with all of you. Um, so as again, huge thanks to our speakers, both on track one, but also on track two. Uh, we are going to be releasing videos. Um, we'll need to figure out how to cut everything and how many we will have, but definitely subscribe um, to Prompt Engineering Conference YouTube channel. You will find videos on my own channel. Um, and yeah, we'll be sharing. Everybody who signed up uh, through the official website from Prompt Engineering Conference, um, if we have your email, we will be following up with slides and more uh, content and also speakers, all the links that we've been bombarding you. Uh, again, huge thanks to the sponsors. And here you go. Thanks to How to Talk to AI, SymphMinds, Prompt, uh, PromptHub.us, and also Prompt Perfect and our community par partners. And yeah, as I mentioned, let's stay in touch so you can um, engage with X uh, account on Prompt Engineering Conference. You can just scan this code. And um, yeah, like if you are still here um, and um, you want to connect with myself, I will drop a link. You can ping me on LinkedIn uh, as well if you have any questions. One thing throughout the whole conference kind of was running in my head that uh, I think Wes and I will definitely um, chase some of the speakers to bring on a podcast. And I think also having deep brief session to kind of narrowing, you know, and summarizing some of the presentations. Um, so I would also drop that you can subscribe um, to the newsletter that we write up at How to Talk to AI and our podcast, of course. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, these are really like, thank you so much for everyone who stayed here with us throughout five hours plus another five hours on track two. Um, this is definitely inspiring and the rabbit, ho the rabbit hole goes very deep as you can see. Um, if you have any questions, again, um, yes, I'm seeing some of the comments. So I'm really, really happy that you guys enjoyed this. Um, and I'm just, yeah, excited to connect with everyone. 
And yeah, let's stay in touch. Thank you so much, everybody. <laughs>